Freeman. Perfect. Well, uh, it should be live now. Um, <laughs> well, it will be in a second. Uh, I'm going to need to do the same thing just so I can tweet that tasty link to our adoring yep, there we fans. Are. Ah, we are? We are there? There it is. We are there. Well, you put solo in quotes just for... <laughs> <laughs> I did that last time, too. It, it seemed fair. Uh, <laughs> I still get to keep the crown, but also other people get to show up. <laughs> okay. Sure. Let me just uh, drop this bad boy on the... Yeah, I know there's a new video live on our channel. Thank you, email. Oh, All right. Oh, oh. I just attach this to that one. Uh, okay. Oh, boy. Okay, sorry. All right. Huh. I'm starting to see the comments flying by, which is good. Means the yes. gang's all here, baby. Everyone is gathering. The team is assembling. Good. We're moments from our final victory. Good. And I am furiously Good. Googling <laughs> to see which of these nerd trivia master lists will be the most optimal for us to use. Yes, uh, because when we were coming up with ideas for how to stream tonight, uh, and I was coming up with the Twitter poll, I was like, hey, what should we do for the uh -huh. third option? And you were like, trivia. And I was like, oh, neat. What would that exactly entail? And I believe your exact words were, I haven't really thought this through. <laughs> so I just like trivia. Yeah, <laughs> who doesn't really? Who go and do bar trivia with me on the regular, and I'm missing it in my life. It's my, like, I've said this before, but my, like, ultimate dream. I will know I have peaked as a person who works in content creation when I get to go on them, um, actually. Oh, and God. And absolutely fail at answering any of those questions. I can so only this, hope. I'm just like a test run for that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, someday, baby. Oh, if you if you dream. network for a few more VidCons, maybe we'll get there. <laughs> Ooh. Oh boy. Uh yeah, so we're you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do the unthinkable and turn down my gain a smidge because I'm peeking into the red every time I get excited. So let me just let me just oh. let me just let me just can you hear me now? Okay, so yeah, that's no that's still eh, it's fine. Eh, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's cool, we're fine here. So uh, what this is probably going to look like is a degree of just, like, back and forth. Here's a nerdy trivia question. Answer it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, as competitive of a person as I am, I think <laughs> the best way to do this is to just, uh, I've read, I just sent you a link to Ho -ho. a article of 110 plus nerd trivia questions. Oh, and maybe I'll no. start from the top of the list and you start from the bottom and we'll just go back and forth <laughs> and ask each other the trivia wow. until we get bored of it, I guess. Are I have, you smarter I than I I didn't think trivia was going to win. I assumed random nonsense. <laughs> would, so this is all, we're just winging it. All right. This is all. This is live producing, baby. I'm scrolling all the way to the bottom. I, I found number 111. Oh, no. These are these are lame questions. These are like, well, hopefully there's some good shit in there. But right now, we're, we're kind of in the boring yeah. nerd shit zone. The first category is called Simple Nerd tri Trivia. Uh, and it's a shame Blue's not here because I think it's pretty good. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. we'll see how long this goes. And, you know, if all else fails, we'll just read some Shakespeare or something. Yeah, I, I mean, we, yeah. we can always... <laughs> I really wanted to do as soon as Red suggested it. <laughs> that was the thing. We it, we made the mistake of, like, making the poll and then immediately realizing which one we wanted to win, which was like, what if we just pulled up a Shakespeare play and just, like, read it back and forth and swapped off, like, any time a new character entered, the other person just played that character. We'd be like, yeah, that would be really cool. And uh, <laughs> now we're here Googling nerd shit. So, mm -hmm, yeah, but mm -hmm. there's always time for that, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, do you want me to start with question 111? I don't think you're going to like sure. it very much. Oh, boy. <laughs> so exciting. Question. The FTSE 100 index is located in which country? Uh, uh I don't know. Finland? <laughs> is that your final answer? <laughs> No, wait, where's Geneva? Uh, That's... Yeah, that... I'm just going to go with Finland. That feels, <laughs> feels wrong, but I'm going to lock it in. Finland, good, final answer. Good news. It is wrong. It's located in the UK. What is the FTSE 100 index? I don't know. Okay. Would you like to hear question one from 110? I'd love to hear question one. Question number one. Name the smallest city in the world. Oh, for God's sake. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's probably one of those like 
niche micro empires on an oil rig or something. I don't know. <laughs> Is that your what, what's yes? Your final <laughs> Vatican City, Rome. What? Be ashamed. Be How is that? Ashamed Wait, like you. <laughs> like smallest by square footage or like population? Wait, either way, it might make sense. Uh, it says smallest city. It does not give any further details. Oh but god. I, okay. Well, I have good news for you. Question one hundred and ten oh, okay. is like a straight up softball. <clears throat> Which oh. film is credited for popularizing the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? <laughs> Mary Poppins. It's Mary Poppins. Good job. Mary, it's the, as far as I'm aware, the only film that uses that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe one of the like subsequent reimaginings or sequels, but they're not the ones who would have popped. That's no. That no. is a gimme. That was a uh, softball. This, what What are they doing? What are they doing this one's beans? not, but you were a math person, so you might know it. Oh god! Uh, don't give them standards. <laughs> Actually, wait, I'm reading the wrong one. That's question number three. Question number two is, uh, what planet is known as the green planet? Earth? Is that your final answer? I, what? Hold, wait, hold on. It's Which one planet the... is known as the green planet? Well, that's sure as hell not a popular nickname, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> it's probably Uranus. One of the gas giants. The others are reddish. What the fuck do you want from me? <laughs> There's not Wait, that many planets. <laughs> what's your final answer, Red? <sighs> Let's go with Uranus. That's correct. Oh, fucking really? It's not green. It's yeah. blue. What are these people doing? <laughs> I only know the planets by their um, Sailor Scout colors. Of course. <laughs> so it would that be feels right Jupiter or Pluto, oh, no. right? Or yeah, whatever. Uh, well, mm, Jupiter is green you're just kind of like a like a teal yeah and then neptune is like a really rich blue shout out to the person in chat yeah. who said namek by the way <laughs> you get it you understand. <laughs> question 109 you hit me let's go the second saturday of june is celebrated for what reason in the united kingdom the united kingdom how many fucking brits are in this question <laughs> did a british ma did dominic noble write these questions I that. he would have done more interesting uh, literature stuff yeah, that's true. I, we would have asked me questions I don't know the answer to. I feel that this is a tangent. I went to VidCon recently. Oh, I'm yeah. not going to say both the stories for the podcast, but I met, uh, I edit for Dominic Noble. We finally met him in person. Shout out, Dom. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very, very nice. And as soon as I met him, I relentlessly started bullying him. And I feel a little bad about that. <laughs> Did you mention the thing about how to pronounce your last name? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, still more ammunition. <laughs> no, why would you say it on stream? It, it's okay. He probably won't see this. <laughs> and if he does, drop a comment. Um, <clears throat> no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, sorry. What was the, the question? The second Saturday of, of June Saturday? is celebrated for what reason in the UK? Uh, is it the holiday with all the poppies on it? That was like a like um. I don't think like so. A, like a Memorial Day kind of thing. Uh, is that your final answer? Yeah, I'm gonna go with them. No, it's the Queen's day. official birthday, so it's gonna be kind of oh, awkward when oh, they get a the new Jubilee! one. Yeah, that thing that just happened. I guess. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you had about a million better things to do than pay attention to an obscure UK holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, all right. Question number three. Name the company founded by Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce on 18 July 1968. First of all, I hate the way they wrote what? that date, and it makes me think even further that maybe this was written by a Brit. 18 uh, July 1968. 18 July 1968. The company founded by two people whose names I don't recognize. Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. Uh... <laughs> um... 1968 is around the right time for it to be a really early like computing company uh mm -hmm. something like that uh unfortunately i don't know very much about old school computer science uh oh, and no. uh my my dad likes doing back in my day when i had to program shit on punch cards uh but i didn't pay very much attention so i'm gonna say they invented fortran or something like that <laughs> Uh, you were on the right track, but you were incorrect. They invented Intel. Oh. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. you know, close mm -hmm. enough. Close enough for government work. Yeah. <sighs> You're getting all the movie questions. <laughs> Thank God. Question. <laughs> what is the meaning of the Dutch term Darth Vader? <laughs> dark Father. Yes, good job. It's Dark Father. <laughs> 
Sorry, I loosely it was translates. I don't. Fu you think I trust anything about the person who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to the author of 110 plus nerd trivia questions. Bah. We're just gonna trust. We need better people. nerd shit. <clears throat> uh, this next question is a, a gimme, but you'll get kick out of it, I guess. Uh, name the largest mammal. The largest mammal? That's got to be the a largest mammal. That's, that's got to be a whale. Mm, do you know which type of whale? Oh. Probably a blue whale. Correct. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! Third grade didn't fail me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, where did the term geek originate? <clears throat> geek? Geek, yeah. Ooh. Where did the term Greek, geek, Greek, huh? Mm. Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, ooh. I... I want to say it's a pop culture thing, but I feel like that that's just based on the vibe of the questions up so far, and it's probably got some, like, farther back thing. So I'm going to say ancient Greece, because this feels like one of those words where they're like, actually, it has, like, an old ancient Greek meaning. Mm. Well, that could technically be correct, but the answer the website gives is the term geek has its origins in the carnivals of the early 1900s. So, oh, wow. real solid pedigree on that one. <laughs> carnivals. <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah <laughs> we might need to find more actual nerd shit <clears throat> i'm gonna skip the next couple because they're all u.s geography questions and i feel like that doesn't play to what's interesting to ask you about you guys so, have you're, um, you're getting interesting questions up there <laughs> this is a sitcom question uh red oh, no. name the sitcom that popularized the term nerd by its heavy use in the 70s oh fuck uh what's the one with had What's the one that has uh, Urkel in it? <laughs> uh, Family Matters? <laughs> Incorrect. Oh, it's Happy Days. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to... Uh Oh. No, you know what? A lot of these are pretty stupid. I'm just going to scroll until I find one that I actually like. <laughs> You would take bets on how long it's going to take us to abandon the <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to answer the question, what does ZIP stand for? Zip? Yeah, ZIP. Like a zip file? Like a zip file, but I don't actually know not what it, in that I just context. Assumed, it, you know, like when you have the little icon and it's got the zipper on it? I just assumed it was a play on that. I didn't realize it's done. No, no, no. <laughs> when I say zip as in zip file, I do not mean this is like the... This is an acronym that is in zip file. I mean, you heard the sound correctly. It's zip like in zip file. Oh, that's the answer? No. <laughs> it's a spelling question? No, it's an acronym question, but I didn't want to mislead you by making you think it was a tech thing. <laughs> oh. Mm hmm. Zipper in <laughs> Premiere. That's not right, but the words all light up. Don't feel bad. This is a dumb one. The answer is zone improvement plan. Oh, thrilling. Ow. Am I right? <laughs> Ow. God. OSHA. Bah. Uh, this is a Star Trek question. I oh, to thank God. Some more interesting ones, which I feel like might be the move. Um, which Star Trek film featured the first fully computer-created sequence in movie history? Film. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh... I'm just going to guess it's the second one where they save the whales. Do you know the name? No. Wait. Star Trek 2, uh, the one with the whales. Name, <laughs> name me any Star Trek film, and I will tell you the answer to this. Uh, Star Trek, The Wrath of Star Khan. Trek. Not the one That's with the, the whales. Answer, it is? Every time, that it, every time there's a Star Trek movie question, the right answer is always The Wrath of Khan, because it's the only one anyone remembers. Nobody remembers the one where they save the whales. <laughs> Okay. I remember the one where they saved the whales, but everyone, like, if, you, if you're at, here's a here's a fun little trick for the audience. If you're at trivia and someone asks a question about Star Trek, it's always the Wrath of Khan. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, uh, these are what? Uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. A lot of these are real bad. Uh. <laughs> Uh, which was the first game to feature multiple endings? We're up to question 82, by the way. <laughs> Clue the movie? No, wait, that's a movie. Uh, game? Is it uh, Earthbound? Maybe? Uh, is, is that your final answer? I'm gonna go with it, so yeah. I'm afraid the answer is Bubble Bobble. 
That ah, hit classic. <laughs> classic RPG. Everyone knows and loves. All, all my homies know and love Bubble Bobble. Yeah. Um, another Star Trek question. When Star Trek premiered, what was the final line of the introductory text of each episode? Uh, uh, to boldly go where no man has gone before? Ding, ding, ding. You got it. Yay. Did, is it because they changed it to no one to be more inclusive after the original series? <laughs> <laughs> mm, possibly. Possibly. Uh, <laughs> this one's so weird. <laughs> I feel bad asking this because it's like, it's enough your thing that you might feel genuinely bad that this is a fucking <laughs> stupid question. <laughs> Pop off. Let's go. Name the James Bond films that have featured a Land Rover. <laughs> that featured a Land Rover? Yeah. Oh, is are they asking for like a specific bond or like the titles of the movies? They're asking for the titles of the movies. Ooh, I'm gonna get this one wrong. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a gimme for this. There are four of them. <laughs> there are four of them. Four of them. Oh Jesus! All right. <laughs> um, Casino Royale. Uh, I'm just gonna name four James Bond movies and hope that by covering a wide range, some of them will be right. Goldfinger. Okay. Uh. Doctor No, um, what is it? Moonraker. That's one of them, right? <laughs> that is one of them. Uh, is that how many did I get? Was uh, it zero out of four? You got zero. <laughs> um, yes, unfortunately, the answers were Octopussy, The Living Daylights, uh, Tomorrow nice. Never Dies, and Skyfall. <laughs> oh, awesome. yeah. Because you know what I'm paying uh, attention to when I'm watching a James Bond movie. The number of Land Rovers present on screen at any given time. Well, everyone knows the Land Rover is the most famous uh, of all the James Bond vehicles. Oh, yeah. Not confused with his actual car. Famous. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like the people in chat saying James Bond, the Wrath of Khan, obviously. <laughs> yes, of course. As we all know, the only correct answer. Yeah. Um, this question. Who, ter- who coined the term robot? Oh, fuck. Um... Oh, it's way older than people think. Uh, I mean, I have no chance in hell of remembering the name. I don't remember the name of, like, people I actually know and like. Uh, Do you remember the, the thing it was in? Uh, well, I'm going to... This isn't correct. I'm going to say Metropolis. Nah, it was Carl Capick in his play Rossum's Universal Robots, right. R-U-R. Right, okay. Cool. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> God, da- all right, more more conspiracy. Th- uh, sorry, more fodder for my. This was written by by a Brit. Uh, conspiracy theory. Question <laughs> seventy four. Where is the River Thames located? <laughs> mm, London, right? That's yes. Good, good job. <laughs> yeah, because that's in um all the Sherlock stuff, <laughs> all the Sherlock Holmes media. That yeah, the that's the one. <laughs> That's how I know it. Not because I have any understanding of London's geography, but because I'm a really big murder mystery fan. Yeah, that tracks. Yeah. Um, oh boy, not all of these are bad. Fortunately, uh, if we speed through it, we can we can go to like a like an actual nerdy trivia website that has like I questions about so Batman much. and stuff like that. Uh, what does HTTP stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> That half-completed CS degree is serving me well. Uh, nice. Question, what is a cow-bison hybrid called? Cow-bison hybrid? Yeah. I didn't know the they cow. made those either. Is it called a, uh, you, you said cow? The cow. The ca- uh, no, unfortunately, the answer is beefalo. Damn it. Yeah. That's so much better than what I came up with. <laughs> Oh, uh, yikes. Okay. What is the hashtag symbol technically called? Oh, I know this one. Uh, It's an Octothorpe. Yeah. I don't know why I know this a one. Fun fact for you. Well, you, it's one of those things where you learn it and it just sort of like sticks yeah. in your head forever. Yeah, that's what I save instead of the names of my friends and loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> this one feels like a gotcha specifically for Brits that I feel like you're not going to fall for. <laughs> I feel like we need to phone Dom at this point. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. We're fine. Uh, name the country which is the leading producer of tea. Leading producer of tea? Yeah. And it's a gimme for the Brits? No, it's it's a trick for the Brits. 
Oh, it's China, right? Yes, it's China. <laughs> yeah. I visited a tea farm while I was in Shanghai. Yeah. That was one of the trips that our, uh, the one of the classes I was in took us on. Heck yeah. Because I was studying abroad, we had to take one of those, like, uh, default. Uh, one of the classes was, like, a one credit history of Shanghai. Mm. And it was basically just, like, every week you'd go on a field trip. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. I also got my ass handed to me in ping pong by a middle schooler on a field trip in that class. It was Ooh, a great time. Yeah, I, I had a blast. Yep, that that'll that'll humble you. <clears throat> yeah. Well, he they it was it's all they basically just sent us loose in a middle school gym class, and that was the field trip for that week. So they were like, "Here's <laughs> like twenty, here's twenty Western college students, uh, go nuts!" And wow. I had some of the better Mandarin of the group. So the, I managed to get myself in with one of the, the crews there. So we, they were trying to teach me and my friend uh, ping pong, and both of us were awful at it. And they were getting, um, they were middle school boys, so they got kind of mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, like, no, that's how it goes. Appropriate. But uh, we bonded. We were friends on WeChat for a while. So Perfect. It's all good. Fantastic. All's well that ends well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, who is known as the Mad Monk of Russia? Oh, uh... Thanks for these uh these softballs. That's Rasputin. <laughs> yes. Ra ra Rasputin if you want to pronounce I was it. That we would. Fun yes, way. Get down the correct. Way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe he's also known as Russia's greatest loved machine. <laughs> I'd respect this <laughs> trivia site so much more if that was one of the questions. <laughs> what is known as Russia's greatest love machine? Uh Oh, for fuck's sake. <clears throat> Question. A Canary Island has been named after which animal? bird is that your final answer yes <laughs> the answer is dog somehow no further explanation is given canary. <laughs> they're called the canary island but they said a specific canary or a specific a canary island so presumably one of the canary islands is named like spot or something but anyway <laughs> well i would name it bird island yeah <laughs> it'd be even better if there were no birds on it <laughs> Funnier. You'll be you'll be hard pressed to find an island with no birds on it of all species. Okay. Oh, I got a good question for you. Uh-oh. How are the names Dumbledore from Harry Potter and Bumblebee, the fictional robot character in the Transformers franchise, linked? What? Uh <laughs> they... Do you need it repeated? No, I heard you. <laughs> uh They're both three syllables with an umble sound in it. Is that your final answer? Yes. <laughs> Incorrect. The name Dumbledore from Harry Potter is an old English word for bumblebee. What? <laughs> That's some hot <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> what? They just bring in Transformers to, to throw me off? <laughs> How yes. dare they? All right, question. What is the world's hottest chili? Chili? Yeah. Um. Oh, I actually used to know the answer to this. It's so long. <laughs> uh, it's not the ghost pepper because that's a pepper. It's got to be a chili, right? Uh, I, I guess. Brain is shut all. <laughs> I, I don't know. Ancho chili. <laughs> uh, sadly, it is the Carolina Reaper. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> Um, which Philip K. Dick novel is Blade Runner loosely based on? Oh, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Yep. All right, this trivia is starting to win me over. It's not all hot bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Question. What do the 100 folds in a chef's hat signify? The 100 times you have to fold like a croissant when you're making it? Uh, no, but that's not as far off from the truth. As it could be? <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about myself. What's the answer? Uh, it's the 100 ways to cook an egg. Oh. I'll be honest, after five, I start running out of ideas, but I guess if you include baking it in stuff, it counts. Yeah, that's going to say. Well, yeah, it depends on how many, like, is adding salt a different step, you know, different mm. preparation. Um, who, t who coined the term nerd, N-U-R-D, an alternative term for nerd, an E-R-D, in 1973? Um. <laughs> term I have not heard since. N-U-R-D in 1973. Mm-hmm. 
I have no chance in hell of getting this right, so I'm just going to shoot the moon and say Bill Clinton. <laughs> no, it was author Philip K. Dick. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Maybe they were having tea or something, and it was like, you know what would be great <laughs> for that most marginalized of communities, the nerds? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you know how they love it when that happens. Yeah. Question: Which country is notoriously known for the alcohol brand vodka? <laughs> uh, Russia. Good job. It's Russia. <laughs> it's Russia. Uh, question: What is the fear of the number thirteen called? Oh no, we've collided. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh no. I guess, I guess right we're done with this website. <laughs> Yeah, oh no, let me look up some other trivia questions. Well, I already I knew that it was Triskaidekaphobia, but... <laughs> oh, I love the person in chat suggesting Robert Frost coined the term nerd. <laughs> nerd. I believe it. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a pretty prolific guy. <laughs> yeah, this. Hmm. Podcast, is it going to be audio only, or are they going to list out the question? I'm doing some quick, uh, quick research, everyone. Hold ten. Yeah. Hang ten. Hold five. Hold five. Hang saying. ten. And uh, spell Triskaidekaphobia more interesting ways in chat. I haven't seen a correct one yet. <laughs> okay, we've got some options. Do okay. you like Star Trek the Original Series trivia? Mm. 1980s video game trivia? Lord of the Rings trivia? Ooh. Quotable Whedonverse trivia? Uh. Classic board game trivia? Looney Tunes trivia? Marvel's The Avengers trivia, oh my Star God. Wars A New Hope trivia, oh my God. 1950s sci-fi movies trivia, <laughs> Jaws trivia, <laughs> Disney Renaissance Trivia, Biology Trivia, Mathematics Trivia, Godzilla <laughs> Trivia, William Shakespeare. Oh, we're doing that one. Oh, we're okay. I, I was kind of curious about what the hell Mathematics Trivia looked like, but... Yeah, it's going to look like red absolutely sweeping because I haven't taken a hard math class since my junior year of high school. <laughs> to be fair, I don't know if proofs are going to give me anything I can use in a math trivia question. <laughs> Well, let's find out what's up with the Shakespeare one, and then we can circle back around. Yes. Do you want easy, intermediate, or hard? Uh, For Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. Let's go hard. Let's see what that looks Alrighty. like. I think the chat deserves a, a fun challenge. I hope this is an audio only, and they actually wrote the questions out. I hope it's not uh, about shit like A Winter's Tale or, you know, <laughs> okay. other stuff cool, I have cool, cool. I'm sending you a link. Yes, good. Actually, wait. This might, here, we're going to adjust the format a little because I think it might be tricky to do this at the same time. Uh -huh. So this one that doesn't show you the answer until you click on the card to flip it over. So I'm going to read the question and then we're going to we're going to tag team this and see if we can figure it out. Perfect. All right. <laughs> let's do we, it. We have it locked in. We'll flip it. <clears throat> okay. Question number one. Mm -hmm. In number of words, which is the shortest Shakespeare play? Oh, fuck. Uh, probably is something dumb like A Winter's Tale. <laughs> I was going to say A Winter's Tale, right? That feels... Well, I guess we have a... We have, we've reached a quorum. Let's see All what right. it is. Flip. A comedy of errors is a mere 14,369 words. Oh, a mere for a simple drabble, that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which Shakespeare play has the highest body count? Oh, that's uh, uh Titus Andronicus. It's got to be. Unless, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess yeah. you could like, there's probably implied background body counts in Macbeth. Like there's a war going on. But if they count like named on screen characters, I think it has to be Titus it's Andronicus. Got to be. At a whooping 14 deaths, it's Titus Andronicus. Yeah, baby! And, like, three of them got baked into pies, so it was bad. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> it was not a fun one. No. Uh, what is the name of Lance's dog in The Two Gentlemen of Verona? Oh, fuck. It is one of the ones I've never read. Um, I don't know. Spot? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm throwing my hat in the ring for Fido. Crab. <laughs> what? <laughs> Crab? It just says crab. Like the crustacean? No sentence around it. It's just the word crab. <laughs> Time for crab. <laughs> What's that word for when everything evolves into crab? It's ca um, uh, carcinification, I believe. Even in Shakespeare, you can't escape the inescapable carcinification. Truly incredible. <laughs> what play contains the famous stage direction, Exit, Pursued by a Bear? Oh, wait. It's one of the comedies, I think, right? Uh... I thought it was a winter's tale. It could be. You know what? I think that sounds right. But that one is another one I have. Can't they just ask us some like some softball Macbeth questions for a change? You wanted hard. You said <laughs> the hard. I one. was hoping it would be like I don't know the fun shit that lets us show off a little bit. Not <laughs> oh fuck another boring one where two well, people we kiss. Were right. It's the winter's tale. Good job. <laughs> uh, 
The phrase, the beast with two backs, comes Ooh. from which play? Oh, frack. Uh, Something that a camel is in. So which play <laughs> could conceivably have contained a camel? Wait, wait. You think the beast with two backs refers to a camel? Right. It's got it, right? They got the two humps? I believe it refers to a couple having sex. <laughs> oh, never mind. That was way off base. It could be anything then. <laughs> what the f- you immediately jumped straight to it's got to be a camel? Well, yeah. Well, now That's I kind of hope you're right. I hope it's like something in The Merchant of Venice where they're like, this be my prized camel. <laughs> Note his snout. <laughs> uh, uh, let's pick a play. Um, uh, uh, I'm, you know what? That sounds like the kind of thing they'd probably put in Much Ado About Nothing. It's like all sex jokes. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Ooh, no, though. It's Othello. Ah. Kids don't have to ask your teacher or parent what it means, so it's definitely not a camel. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> Ferdinand and his three companions take an oath not to give in to the company of women in what play? Ugh, damn it. Um, isn't Ferdinand one of the characters in Much Ado About Nothing? No, I, no. I'm pretty you... confident about the answer to this one. Oh, okay, well, what do you think it is? Love's labor lost. Oh, you know what? Probably. That that makes a lot of sense. Let's give it. Let's do it. Yes, it was love's labor's lost. Chat adores the fact that you assumed the beast with two backs was a camel, but I have to tell the person who said Ace Energy Strong, Indigo's the only person in the core row as speaker who's not Ace. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I just wanted to assume the best. I remember that we were talking about Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. Despite the title, which of most of which play revolves around Agamemnon and Priam during the Trojan War? Oh, uh, wait, Agamemnon and Priam. I don't know this one. Um, I know that, uh, the, f- there's, uh, there's a couple Greek heroes in A Midsummer Night's Dream, like, for some fucking reason. It's about, like, Hippolyta and Theseus, I want to say. I don't think most of that play is about it, though. No, it's not. Uh, despite the title... I feel like this is one of the ones I didn't read because I have no memory. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. Uh, let's just pick a couple at random and, and scatter shot. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona. <laughs> uh, looking over my bookshelf for going. Oh, wait. Chat. The fifth. And okay. It's oh, Troilus and Cressida. All right. Someone in chat actually got that first. And I was like, oh, is it too late Shout to cheat? To <laughs> yeah, chat. you got it, bud. I know. I have. I don't have chat open. So if, if you're cheating, I can't hold it to you. <laughs> It just shows um, on my, my window because I'm running the stream, so. Oh. In what play does the titular character renounce society and go to live in a cave in the wilderness? Uh, uh, the Oh, uh, King Lear, I think. I think it might be Timon of Athens. Oh, that's fully possible. I think there's a bit where King Lear is nuts and like out of the wilderness with no pants on, but Timon mm. of Athens might be actually about that. Let's All give right. it a shot. Ooh, the answer was Timon of Athens. Ha ha! Timon? Timon? I don't know. Timon. Not the Lion King guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last two questions. This question number nine. During a performance of what play did a cannon shot ignite the roof of the Globe Theater and burn it to the ground? Ooh. I knew about I knew about the globe burning. Uh I did not know that it burned down from a cannon shot. That's I guess which that. play includes You're a learning. cannon? Um Huh. One of the Henrys, maybe? Oh, you know what? It totally could be one of the Henrys. They do a lot of battle scenes. Um, so many Henrys, though. Which one is it? <laughs> Let's try Henry V. <laughs> I think that one was pretty exciting. All right. Henry V? Yeah. Oh, we were close. It is a Henry, but <gasps> it's Henry the uh, Eighth. Ah, the other Henry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Shame. No. Shamesies. We tried. And for our last of the difficult Shakespeare questions, yes, good. the phrase, to gild the lily, is a misquote from what play? Huh. Gilding the lily, it, it refers to, like, unnecessarily adding trappings to make something already beautiful, you know, more mm. garish. That could be anything with a pretty woman in it, which is all of them. <laughs> Literally any of the comedy. Yeah. Ah, or tragedy. Othello. <laughs> uh, uh, I think if it were in Romeo and Juliet, we'd have the full quote. Yeah, it's not. Ro- I feel confident that it's not Romeo and Juliet based on the amount of times that I've watched Romeo plus Juliet. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. So um, I feel it's like not it's one of Hamlet's be... monologues because. No. Yeah, he never shuts up. Not so. a McNope. No. 
I don't months. think it's a Midsummer Night's Dream. No, 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 no. I, I remember, and it's not in. I don't think it's in the Tempest. <sighs> I'm trying really hard not to look at chat right now because I'm sure they've already got it. Uh, let's uh, let's just assume it's not in Much Do About Nothing either. I think. Uh, yeah, no, I don't it's not the kind so. of thing Beatrice or Benedict would make jokes about. Not Coriolanus. Probably. I don't think it's one of the Henrys. Hmm. And I don't think it's in... We can narrow this down by the fact that I don't know, and I've read a lot of the plays, but not all of them. So it's almost certainly not Merchant of Venice. Yeah. Uh, I've read all of them, but it's been a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's probably one of the weird ones. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to guess it's a Winter's Tale again. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll guess Othello, just for the hell of it. And we are both wrong. It's King John. King John? King John. I didn't even know that one existed. <laughs> Did they say what the actual line is? Uh, no. Okay, fantastic. Would you like to try Shakespeare trivia on intermediate? Yeah, or we could switch topics. Uh, yeah, you know, okay. Shakespeare intermediate will stick around. Uh, Pixar Studios, Canada, History and Geography, that one's promising. <laughs> uh, Spider-Man, French Revolution, Astronomy, what Fine the Arts, fuck? The X-Files. Wait, the let's Legend do Astronomy, I'm curious. <laughs> Oh Jesus! Scooping <laughs> noise uh, oh, in my headset. Um, yeah. Do you want easy, intermediate, or hard? Let's do intermediate for astronomy. We'll see. Cool. Yeah. You're gonna have to carry on this one because I'm gonna tell you right now that I do not know a lot about <laughs> well, astronomy. Well, let's not let's that not get not, crazy here. I don't remember not a lot. It's not a Sailor Moon character. I do not know what it is. Um, ooh, <laughs> first question: What color is Pluto? Uh, it's mostly kind of like a peachy tan. Like, we have the close-up pictures now. It's got that big, like, heart-shaped crater or volcanic plane. Hmm, yes. Uh, well, Sailor Pluto. Uh-huh. Sailor Moon anime. Yeah. That, she's that, like, like, like green hair and then, like, like a dark blue kind of navy thing going on. Um, so I'm going to guess navy blue. Uh, would you like me to flip the answer? Yes, please. <laughs> Ooh, I was wrong. It's pink. Yay! Really? And it has a heart on it. Oh, thanks, Astronomy Facts. Yeah. Question number two. Uranus, William Herschel, the astronomer, was trying to win favor from King George III. What's the question here? Yeah, is there a question? <laughs> when I flip it over for the answer, it says gangrene in his leg, which provides no further clues as to what the question is. Is this some to kind to of like crowdsourced <laughs> website where people no, can just it's a podcast uh -huh. uh, that has their questions listed out? I guess to shout them out, it's the dorky, geeky, nerdy podcast, and they were the first site that popped up when I googled <laughs> nerdy trivia. Um, cool. I got nothing about this one. I, I have to assume that that is a site error. Yeah, uh, number probably. three. Which planet's orbit helped usher in the adoption of the general theory of relativity? Uh, oh, that's a weird one. Um, I feel like, the thing is, I know something about this because there's like a wobble in the orbit of, I want to say Uranus, uh, that has led us to like constantly look for like a gravitic attractor out beyond it because that would explain why it wobbles the way it does. Um, that's why we were even looking for Neptune. That's why we were so excited when we found Pluto, but then it turned out Pluto was dinky. Uh, for a mm. while, there was a theorized <laughs> a theorized planet X that was named oh, before it was discovered that. called Tyche. <laughs> but chat's saying it's Mercury, so it's probably Mercury. <laughs> I didn't mean to look. I'm sorry. <laughs> chat is correct. <coughs> it's Mercury. Woo! Go, go chat. <clears throat> Good call, Question cutting me off on that. I have a lot more fun facts about the non-existent planet X. <laughs> and I may or may not... No, no, chat doesn't get to hear that story. We're good. <laughs> Please continue. Okay. Which was the first black hole to be imagined from Earth? Oh. What? To be imagined from Earth? Uh... Imaged, sorry. That's me oh, misreading imaged. Word. Uh, image from Earth. Oh, <laughs> that makes much more first sense. Black hole image I was gonna from say Earth. like, what's the is Event Horizon's got a black <laughs> hole in it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, it's got an engine that produces a miniature black hole. Yeah, that one. No that organically sourced black holes are present in Event Horizon. Uh, but which is the red? You're the carry on this trivia <laughs> question. Which is the first to be Im imaged from Earth? I don't know. All these things are named something like N six hundred and seventy four. Like. <laughs> 
unless it's Sagittarius Alpha, the giant one in the center of the Milky Way, I got nothing. Uh, nope, it is Messier 87. Great. M87. Yeah, see what I mean? <laughs> what is the second closest star to Earth? Oh, uh, b- uh, fucking... I think I might actually... Is this Alpha Centauri? I, yeah, it's Alpha Centauri. They love talking about that shit in sci-fi movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are we... We are correct. Yeah. Proxima Centauri, a.k.a. Alpha Centauri C, approximately 4.22 light years away. Yep. Proxima because it's close. Oh, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho. Which asteroid, the largest in the asteroid belt, used to be considered a planet? Uh, oh, man. Damn it. I don't know. It's probably named after some Greek minor goddess. <laughs> they usually are. Uh, <laughs> Almost always. Or yeah. Roman, if you want to be or, funky. Yeah, with yeah, yeah. Uh, largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. I got nothing. Sorry. Uh, Ceres? Ceres? Ceres. Ah, oh, damn it. I think, I, I think that is a minor deity. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a Greek name, so I'm assuming that that's right, but I don't know who it is. Yeah. What astronomical bodies are assigned LGM catalog numbers? LGM? Uh, okay, well, there aren't that many types of astronomical bodies. Um, we theorize exoplanets, but we don't actually see them most of the time. So they're probably either stars, black holes, or I guess galaxies. You know what? Let's try galaxies. I'm sorry, you are incorrect. The correct answer was pulsars, which are rapidly rotating neutron stars. At first, the natural radio pulses were thought to be artificial, Mm -hmm. and the LGM designation came about because the astronomers wondered if they were seeing little green men. Oh, for fuck's sake. (laughs) Okay. I can feel myself slipping into my radio voice the longer that I'm reading this question. (laughs) Uh, Question number eight. When a sufficiently large star runs out of hydrogen to power its fusion, it becomes a red giant and fuses which element instead? Helium, because it that's like the next biggest thing. <laughs> that's incorrect. It fuses hydrogen. Wait. It said it ran out of hydrogen. Wait, that is... Hmm. Runs out of hydrogen to power its fusion, becomes a red giant Hold and on. fuses which element instead? I'm Googling this. What? I'm googling this now. The internet must know. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a fun one. Well, huh. I uh I think they do fuse helium. Well, chat is saying helium, so I at least feel validated. I mean, I don't know enough about the stars to tell you that you're wrong, so I'm inclined to trust you on that. I think the thing is that hydrogen fusion doesn't entirely stop when they expand into a red giant, but once they predominantly start fusing helium, um, hmm. it's like they have a shell that burns hydrogen, and they it, it piles up helium in the core, which... It fuses because that's, you know, that basically all they are is a big fusion reactor. Uh, and that's oh. how you get heavier and heavier elements is they just, you know, smash more of that stuff together. Uh, the the e- chat is correct. The last element that stars fuse before they burn out entirely is typically iron, the heaviest element possible to create mm. through that kind of fusion. Um, Fun facts. Yeah. We've got two more questions left in intermediate astronomy. Tasty. Nine is uh, which star, also known as the North Star, is particularly useful in navigation? And I think I might actually know this one, because isn't it Polaris? It's Polaris, yeah. Although, fun fact, uh, uh, because of, I think, axial precession, um, the position of the North Star is flexible. Uh, Essentially, the true north of Earth's, uh, not orbit, uh, spinning, God, brain, come on. Rotation? <laughs> yes, thank you. I've been so busy this week. Uh, uh, the true north of that sort of slowly shifts around. So Polaris is the closest star to that point right now, but it has been different stars in the past. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah. Very cool. Polaris this isn't is even that bright question. or special. It's <laughs> it, People only pay attention to it because it's the one star that doesn't move. 
Anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's a useful navigational tool, I'm mm -hmm. told. I don't really navigate by the stars much this, these days. Uh, this, <laughs> this next question uh, is the last one in the astronomy intermediate level. Which astronomical body is formed of a thick, hard crust containing a single, massive atomic nucleus? What? Wait. Oh, that's probably a neutron star, isn't it? Um... It is a neutron star. Hey! <laughs> you got it in one. I was like, <laughs> it, it took me a second. Like, it takes a lot of work to get <laughs> that many, you know, that, that many protons or neutrons or anything in, in one space without, you know, getting mm -hmm. some kind of atomic subdivision. But it's like, oh, wait, there's one thing that does that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I 100% know what question we're going to do next because yes. there's Star Trek The Next Generation trivia and I feel like it would we be illegal of us to move past that. Do we you want easy, must. intermediate, or hard? <laughs> For this one, let's go hard. We're not going to do hard, well, right. but may as well. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do poorly, but we're going to do all the same. Um, oh. Oh? I got this one. Known as the first lady of Star Trek, who played Luxana Troy? Oh, right. I mean, you know her name, but I know that she's mm -hmm. Gene Roddenberry's wife. Yes. She was also the voice of the Enterprise's computer. It's uh, Majil Barrett. Ah. Or Majil, I don't know how to say her first name, unfortunately, but Barrett, last name. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, she's been in, I think, every track because yeah. she was the computer. I believe that's correct, yeah. And then also Luxana Troy, a beloved uh, character actress. Oh, it's, not it's not her uh, fault that every episode she turns up in is unwatchably horny. <laughs> I like those episodes. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're funny. <laughs> I think that she's a really funny actress and I'm afraid that she Picard and comfortable is very entertaining to watch. And then she shows up in DS9 and she has an even more fun dynamic going on where she gets to actually have like serious arcs for a little bit. Incredible. Um, two, which technology most closely associated with Next Generation actually made its first appearance in The Practical Joker from the animated series? Uh, what? So, Star Trek technology. So let's go through. There are, are, yeah, okay. There's phasers. There's phasers, but those were in the original ones. So. Teleportation. Those were in the original. Yeah. I, I guess um, for TNG, did, did they have dilithium crystals in the original? I think so, because they would occasionally be like, we got a flux capacitor. Or right. Um, um, it could be Android technology, could be Geordi's little visor thingy. Uh, did, did they have the holodeck in the original? I don't. Yes, I think they did. Did they have the replicator? I think they have the replicators. Well, sorry, chat's saying... I, no, I I shan't say anymore. <laughs> um, I think it might be holodeck. It might... Well, <laughs> my assumption that <laughs> it was that the, the holodeck... Well, the thing is, I think my assumption that there was no holodeck, or that there was a holodeck, is because I've seen, like, shots of, like, you know, Kirk and Spock and, like, you know like 60s period dress but also they time traveled a lot so that doesn't I actually mean anything like them going to funky planets though. yeah i don't remember them ever actually being like because in the later series they'd be like oh we're gonna go do the sherlock episode data's yep. gonna go hang out yep. in the holodeck for then for like yeah they're just minutes. gonna they're just gonna larp for a while it's great uh i yeah let's let's say holodeck oh we're right hey thanks chat nice <laughs> who made his directorial debut with the episode rascals uh, I'm just gonna guess Jonathan Frakes. I know he's directed yeah, a lot right. since then, but sure. Oh, we're both wrong. It's Adam Nimoy, son of Leonard Nimoy. Oh, that's cool. Good yeah, on him. Good for him. Yeah. Good for them. Which next generation regular cast members also appear on Star Trek Enterprise? Okay. Uh, off the top of the dome, definitely Jonathan Frakes. Right. Because I'm pretty sure Riker's been on that, and if he was there. Michael Dorn, right? Right. Worf shows up a lot in other places. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if he was in Enterprise, because I know he's in DS9. Hmm. Uh, do they have Jordy show up? I don't think jordy has been in too many other shows. Data? He's, he's pretty player. easy to maybe, replicate. Data, maybe. <laughs> I feel like if Riker was there, then Troy probably was also. She could be. Um, they usually had paired them up in future series. Yeah, but also, didn't he have a couple like clones running around after a while? He did. Yeah, he, <laughs> he had the clone that had the um, was it the sideburns or something? I it's don't know. I didn't get that up. far. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till you get to Riker's evil clone. <laughs> you don't look so surprised. You've seen a lot of TNG just by living this. My cat is staring at me from the hallway. Uh, um, I don't know. I feel 
good on Riker, likely on Troy. I don't know. All right, let, let's go with Troy and Riker and see see what goes from there. Okay, we got Riker and Troy. Good. Uh, but the third is Brent Spiner, who appears as the ancestor of Dr. Song, who was involved ah, in genetic engineering. <laughs> see, my suggestion of data was was a good one. Not not that far off. Yeah, well, they did say cast member, not character. Yes. Uh, but they they Jonathan Frakes and Frakes yes, of course, appeared as Riker and Troy. Right. Uh, question five: Which regular cast member of Babylon Five had a recurring role in Star Trek: The Next Generation? I have no hope of knowing this. <laughs> yeah, I uh, have not seen Babylon Five. <laughs> Similarly, do not know. Yeah. Um, no idea. The answer is Andreas Katsulas, who played Gakar on B5, and also played Romulan Commander Tomaluk on Star Trek The Next Generation. Every word of that sentence was practically meaningless to me. <laughs> <laughs> Question six. What modulation frequency do the deflector shields operate on? You're fucking kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> you picked hard. 98.7 WFMT. <laughs> Classical no, radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's 257.4 mhz so was that megahertz, megahertz? wow yeah. what valuable information <laughs> in case you need to know Woo. if you're out there and you're trying yeah. to raise the shield you gotta modulate now. them shields to the right frequency Mo modulate the shield frequency so that they can beam through <laughs> they can do this like every other episode <laughs> yeah but they usually modulate it to different frequencies <laughs> To mess with whatever <laughs> random alien bullshit of the week they're dealing with. Ah. Ooh, I like this question because, because I know the answer. Oh, yeah? Uh, seven, which crew member figured out a way to transport through deflector shields? Uh, I don't know if you've gotten to this point yet. It's probably but... Jordy, right? He's real smart. Incorrect. It is Miles O'Brien, the most <gasps> important Chief man O'Brien! Chief O'Brien! Is that why everybody won't shut up about him? Well, he's also one of the main car like main crew in uh, DS9. Oh. So he goes on to he moves on from being sort of like the B tier of the Enterprise crew to yeah. the A tier of the. He mostly season. exists to get bitch slapped by whatever transporter monstrosity they bring in. That kind of stays the same, except oh, he just good. gets bitch slapped by a wider variety of technological issues. Well, that's really what uh, what job advancement looks like in the Star Trek yeah, universe. But they reference his credentials as being the guy who figured out transporting through deflector shields. Cool. It's got to be tough being single-handedly the person who makes warfare pretty much irrelevant. <laughs> or gives Worf um, something to do, depending on your perspective. Depending on your perspective. Just put him on their ship and let him have fun. Uh, question eight. Which character was named after the series creator? Probably someone named Jean. If you... I'm going to let you... I know the answer to this one also. So think it through for a second. Uh-huh. Character on the Enterprise, yep. most likely to be a self-insert or, like, audience surrogate character. Oh, fucking, uh, uh, Wesley? <laughs> Hell yeah, it's Wesley Crusher, really? named after Eugene Wesley Roddenberry. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cute, I oh, guess. Wesley. <laughs> I guess. Oh, uh, <laughs> Wesley. I'm Honestly, like, I'm Wesley just glad that, like... The worst of the Star Trek kids. <laughs> I'm just glad that Will Wheaton is having a fun career. And like the thing yeah, is Yeah, good for him. Well the odd thing is like he's actually got a pretty recognizable voice, but he keeps cameoing and stuff, and then I don't notice until like months later when I wake up and I'm like, Oh Morningstar was fucking Will Wheaton. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's like I kept getting surprised Travis Willingham for a while there because I'd be watching I was reliving my anime phase. I think that's shows. that's more like, inexcusable. Hey, Travis is very recognizable, but Will okay, Wheaton the one the one I think I can get away with is he's an Oron High School host club, but he plays a character who only goes like, hmm. Yeah, the every, character like, who basically episodes. never talks. Yeah, that one's fair. <laughs> and that one got me, because when he did have a line, I was like, wait a, wait a fucking you second. Is that you, Knuckles the Echidna? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that you? Will Wheaton was also, I believe, Aqualad in Teen Titans, and when I rewatched one of those oh, he... episodes, I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> so... It's Once just you a start great recognizing career. Recognizing people for their voice, you have to really recontextualize how you watch cartoons because all of a sudden it's like, I know every single one of them. Oh my God, dude, I ruined cartoons for myself for like a solid year and a half when I started getting interested in voice acting. <laughs> <laughs> it took Ugh. a while to get back to functionality. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question is question number nine. 
When he realized this set wasn't going to be built for the pilot, Gene Roddenberry added a scene in what part of the Enterprise? Oh, uh, probably the bar, right? Uh, Ten Forward? No, I think Ten Forward... Well, maybe. Alright, let's go with Ten Forward. Yeah. I got nothing on this one. Um... Oh, nope, it is the engine room. Ah, fine. That's a weird thing to leave out of the pilot. You have to have a role for Whoopi Goldberg to be in, you know? Well, yes. It's critical. Guinan is an important part of the show. She's part of the fabric of the team. She's great, and I love 10 Forward. It, that felt like the kind of thing that like they would want to establish early as like, a, this is a cool new show. We've got a bar now. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That strikes me as like a, well, we better put this in here, because if we don't, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people won't know that we're doing this whole thing. Uh, but the last question in the Star Trek trivia, TNG hard round. Yeah. Who is Alexander's mother? Um, have you gotten to Warp Oh, Stadia? wait, yeah, yeah. I don't remember her name, but she was this badass, like, uh, ambassador, half Klingon lady. Uh, yeah. And all of her flirting involved kicking Worf's ass. She was great. And I was <laughs> yep. like, she's too cool to survive the episode. And I was right. <laughs> So I, I don't know her name, there and is, I have no chance um, of remembering another it. Another great half Klingon lady in Voyager, because they were just like, what if we did that thing that we did in TNG that people liked for an episode, and then we actually let her survive an entire series? Yes. <laughs> um, but it's Kel Keller? I uh, got nothing but cool. I don't know how to read Klingon. So that's my <laughs> biggest L as a Trek fan. Jamesies. <laughs> Um, well, we got Scooby Doo trivia, Pirates and Maritime. <laughs> we can't trivia. do Scooby Doo trivia. There's like 60 years of canon for Scooby Doo. Quotable 1980s trivia. What the? F no. <laughs> DC Comics villains trivia, monster movie monster trivia. We practice. passed some really good ones early on. Let's 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 start I know, from the top. Now again. that we're in the dregs, no. Really <laughs> in our stride. No. Ghostbusters trivia. No. Star Trek Deep Space Nine trivia. I haven't uh, watched it. <laughs> Christmas traditions around the world trivia. Oh God. A Christmas Carol trivia. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Card game trivia, How about... the life and works of Edgar Allan Poe trivia, women in comics, the Academy Awards trivia. How about we try uh, that one math year one? And... <laughs> that one sounds fun. Nah. Let's give it a shot. We never know. <laughs> Maybe it'll be terrible okay. for me. Yeah, hold on. I got to find it because I got to scroll back up. Give okay. me one sec. Okay. Mathematics, easy, intermediate, or hard? Let's, let's, let's do intermediate. Why not? Okay. Okay. And then we can do the Lord I of the Rings I got to read one. equations out of it. Oh no. 10 followed by 100 zeros is called what? Uh that's a Google. I believe. It is correct. Yeah. You are, it is a Google. Which field of math is named for a mispronunciation of an Arabic phrase meaning reunion of broken parts? What? Uh oh, it's probably algebra. Correct. What? <laughs> okay. This is not <laughs> as fun as I wanted it to be. <laughs> Parabole Hyperbole, circles, and ellipses are all part of which class of relations? Oh, Jesus. Um, I don't know what a class of relation is. That's so. not exactly terminology I dealt with very much either. Uh, but I... Uh, something to do with ellipses and shit. Um, <laughs> I got nothing. Sorry. Conic functions. Con oh, right, because it's, it's things that you can get by intersecting cones with planes. That's a yeah, stupid way of phrasing I'm, that. <laughs> it is. I'm watching my cat stick her paw in because I got her a new like one of the like water bowls. It's like a fountain so that it like mm -hmm. keeps it flowing, um, and she likes it. She's been drinking out of it a lot. She's also taken to, as I'm seeing now, sticking her paw directly into the stream of water and then spraying it all around by shaking <laughs> her paw and then licking her paw to drink the water. And I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in her head right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's enrichment. It's fine. <laughs> I guess. My hallway is really wet now. <laughs> Unforeseen side effect. But you know what? I guess if she's happy and hydrated. Ziggy, yeah, as long as she's drinking doing? water, it's fine. It's a very roundabout way to get to it, but she's gotten to it. Oh, she's doing the Halloween cat stretch. Yeah. little black cat so when she does the full back arch. That's what she We've deserves. We've got a skeleton and a cat in my apartment, so when Halloween rolls around, we're never going to decorate. Hell yeah. <laughs> um... What broad category can be subdivided into studies of group, rings, and fields? Uh, that's, well, normally they are subdivided as, like, group theory, ring theory, and field theory. Um, I guess that's, oh, fuck. Um, 
This is not a math question. This is a phrasing question. <laughs> uh, it's about math. Uh, this is the shit I never paid attention to. <laughs> um, Ooh, who's laughing now? Not me. No. <laughs> I don't know how to do math. It's not topology, but that's all my brain is volunteering. It's aggressively not topology. <laughs> um, uh, wait, hold on. No, fuck it. It's, it's set theory. Thank you, chat. I knew it was on the tip of my tongue, except this, it wasn't coming. The uh, website says algebra. <laughs> Are you fucking serious? <laughs> that's, I guess, from a certain point of view. <laughs> no, no, that's fully wrong. A lot of what you do in groups, rings, and theaters is shit like you know, modular arithmetic. So the person in the chat asking where Wooder comes from, uh, I grew up in the greater Philadelphia area, and that's why I have that accent. Don't worry about it too much. Hmm. Um, this next question. To be considered a function, a relation must pass which test? Oh, right. Uh, usually they just gotta go, like if you're bringing you know, a new relative into the fold, <laughs> you gotta go hang out. <laughs> no, it's the, uh, I believe it's the I don't remember the exact name for it, uh, but it basically cannot, it's like the y-intercept test or something. Um, in order for it to be a function, uh, every x value has to have um, only one y value associated with it. So a parabola counts as a function, but if you flipped it on its side, it wouldn't count as a function anymore. Um but you know what? 50-50 odds. Let's just say it's algebra. Let's see if they get that right. They have, nope, it has to pass the, the algebra. the vertical test. line test. Yeah, the y-intercept test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was correct. To I just didn't have the name. <laughs> to fully study this field, one will need to be able to write in at least four colors. Oh. What field is this? Uh, the full, The four-color theorem is about... It's it's like a geometric theory, um, but specifically in relation to math. But let's just say algebra again. Let's see if that's correct. <laughs> nope. Topology. Topology. T-O-P-O-L-O-G-Y. Yeah, no, I, I know what topology is. It's just, I guess that's technically correct. But that's such a what? weird way of phrasing it. What term is used to describe a detailed study of real numbers, often being used to justify calculus? Fun fact, I have never taken a calculus class. You're not missing much. Um, I tapped out at stats. A detailed uh, study of real numbers? I got nothing. You know what? <laughs> this, this the is... answer to this one made me genuinely angry when I flipped the card. <laughs> yes, what is it? What is it? Real analysis. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I, now I see why I never paid attention uh, to this part. <laughs> what number is denoted by a lowercase j in electrical engineering? Oh, and that's not I math. In virtually every other context. Oh, um, square root of minus one, I guess, the imaginary number. Lowercase i in virtually every other contest, the square root of negative one. Yeah. Hey-oh. Yeah, I think the thing is uh, you can technically... It's like some weird vector thing. You can get imaginary vectors, mm. i, j, and k, uh, for essentially, yeah, you know what? It's fine. It's stupid. They're all technically the same, but they call them different <laughs> things. What function created by physicist Paul Dirac accidentally spawned the theory and study of distributions? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it might be some weird fractal thing, but it's probably something boring like the normal distribution the Dirac delta function wow that's so informative <laughs> i would like the math nerds of the world to get more creative with their naming convention on these things um they do sometimes you get things like Cantor's dust which sounds like a magical component <laughs> that sounds like a drug is what it sounds yeah it like. also sounds like a drug it's fractals <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a drug it's fractals those two things are not related. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that someone would drop in like an edgy sherlock adaptation <laughs> oh damn it you're <laughs> like, so right it's not a drug it's a fractal watson <laughs> all the kids these days are taking Cantor's dust <laughs> just keeps them going all the way down <laughs> They put it under a microscope and it would be like a little fractal look and that's some, how it explains how it's so potent well, on the street. It's more like they put it under a microscope and it looks exactly the same as it does at regular scale. 
<laughs> like a fractal does. <laughs> I don't as know expected. what a fractal is, for being completely honest. I'm just rolling with it. Oh, uh, uh, last question yeah, okay. with the hard math. <laughs> Uh -huh. Which branch of math deals exclusively with terms of a single variable with exponent one or constants? Um, I guess that must be linear algebra, linear equations. I think ding, linear algebra is really linear algebra. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, oh, good Ooh. job, team. <laughs> I'm going to get a good grade in YouTube trivia. This <laughs> is something that is normal to want and possible to achieve. <laughs> A phrase that is always funny. Um, I'm reloading the page. Good to idea. See if we've got any other good categories. We should I'm do the Lord of the Rings the one. I, I think it'll be fun. What there it, are. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> I think the Lord of the Rings one actually might be a bad idea because it's probably going to have like mm, lore shit from the Silmarillion. Lore. Shit. They'll be like, "What is the name of Tom Bombadil's wife?" <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I actually uh, remember this, yeah. but only just barely. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling up. We actually got almost to the bottom when we were hitting the TNG trivia. Ah. Um, quotable 1980s trivia is calling God. to me. Uh, okay. Science fiction You're going to have to hard Pirate carry on the 1980s one. <laughs> Are you intermediate on that one then? Why not? Yeah. Oh, this first one. Mm -hmm. So I think what the goal is is you have to name what it's from because they're giving us the full quote. Okay. And if you don't get this one, I'm going to be a little bit sad. Uh, by the power of Grayskull, I have the power. Oh, fucking He-Man, really? <laughs> All right. Fucking He-Man. Maybe this isn't going to be so bad, actually. <laughs> Quote number two. Knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe? It is G.I. Joe. Literally, that's how you continue the quote. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire... The Ghostbusters? <laughs> Yay, team. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Ooh. I can't do a Scottish accent, but oh, this no. one is uh, Curse Me Kilts. That's fucking Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> yeah, from what show? DuckTales? <laughs> yep. He says that in the new one, too. <laughs> of course he does. Yeah. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. <laughs> What? This is a good line. I don't, I don't know, know. From, but I appreciate the line. Okay, let's. It let's... sounds like a Fraser line, but I don't think it's from Fraser. I'm gonna shoot the moon and say that's in Terminator. <laughs> We're both wrong. I was closer. It's in Cheers. Ah, uh, I think it would have been pretty funny if uh, what the fuck is the name? It was in Terminator. It'd be pretty solid. <laughs> What's the name of the guy <laughs> that they send back in time? Oh, oh, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> no, the other guy. <laughs> I don't know, man. The, it's been a while since I think I it would be funny if, like, years. when he's, like, bleeding out and trying to get Sarah Connor to safety, he's like, oh, it's a doggy dog world, and I'm eating milk bone underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and then he dies immediately. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. What's next? <laughs> as God as my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. Oh. Yeah. Isn't that from, like, that one skit? Uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. Uh, okay. Uh... I got nothing. Yeah, I got nothing. It's okay. WKRP. Kyle yeah. Reese. Thank you, chat. I think it would be funny if those were Kyle Reese's last words. <laughs> <laughs> it's a doggy dog world and I'm wearing milk bone. Yeah, and then the Terminator kills him. It's yeah. poetic Perfection. cinema. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This next quote could be from fucking anything. <laughs> Let's be careful out there. What? <laughs> what is that from? Uh, I'm going to say also Terminator. <laughs> And you'd be also wrong. It's from Hill Street Blues. I have no idea what that is. Uh, quote number eight. The balcony is closed. That one's definitely Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big one-liner before she kicks him into the, uh, the, the thing that squishes him. <laughs> and again, it is not Terminator. It is Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Oh, well, that wouldn't have helped me anyway. <laughs> If you don't get this next one wrong, I'm going to be similarly very sad. Like with the first one, this quote is, and I'll form the head. That's Voltron, right? Yes. Okay. This it could have also Voltron. been Power Rangers with one of the Zords or something. But Now, Voltron is very famous for explicitly calling out which part of the Zord they're going to... Right. Run, it's not called the Zord. Lion. It's called Voltron. It's not called the Zord. <laughs> it's called Voltron. <laughs> They're the, they're the lion, then they're the bigger, not a lion guy. Yeah, that's the one. What I love about original Voltron is they like they refuse to kill the character who's supposed to die at the beginning. 
Yes. So when they're cradling his body, they're like, and then Sven, speak to me. And he's like, I'm okay. Take me to Hospital Planet. And then they do. And then they never see him again. <laughs> never come back. But I got to say, oh. I respect Voltron because the first time they're like forming Voltron and fighting the bad guy, the pink princess Allura is like, oh no, I must help them. And she runs up to the roof of her castle and pulls out a fucking mounted minigun. <laughs> she starts unloading on the bad guys with it. Like, don't worry, brave heroes. And I was like, I kind of like this lady. OG 80s Voltron has its moments. Yeah. Uh, it also is painfully OG 80s Voltron. Oh, it hurts a lot, but it has its moments. But in a, in a fun way. Yeah. Um, and the last quote, and then I think we should do this on hard okay. as well, because I'm interested to see what they put in the quote category. Yeah, I'm this curious. last one, though, is Holy Macanoli. Holy Macanoli? I'm going to say that's in The Godfather. <laughs> nope. It's, first of all, that's insulting. Second of all, it's Funky Brewster. Oh, is that better? <laughs> Marginally, okay. <laughs> you think someone in the Godfather exclaimed, "Exclaimed the holy macaroni!" I'm sorry for the microaggression, but oh my god! <laughs> All right, this is the hard version of the 1980s quotes. Let's do it. First quote: "Don't leave home without it." What? Uh, pogs. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Put something in the 80s. You wouldn't. Have, you're. Mm. What were they? It, what like it was like that car phone? That's not a thing. I don't I know. What's don't. the answer? Tell me the yeah, answer. Yeah. What is it? American Express. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh wait! I could have inferred that from the iconic scene in Batman and Robin <laughs> with oh the bad credit gosh, card. Right. Never leave the cave without it. <laughs> we were not alive in the eighties, and I think it's starting to show a little bit. Uh, quote number two: Where's the beef? Oh, that's that's that ad. Uh, yeah. You know which fast food chain this is an ad for? Arby's? Nope. Nope. What is it? It's Wendy's. Wendy's? Ah. Wendy's. Can't Wendy's. have been that good. <laughs> <laughs> Quote three. The choice of a new generation. Oh. Are these all ads? These are all ads. Wasn't there an um actually about this exact thing? Probably. Okay. Uh, choice of a new generation. Also Pogs, I'll say. Nope. Uh, Pepsi. Pepsi. Oh, how wrong they were. <laughs> yeah. Four, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. I'm going to say that's from the hit movie Batman and Robin. <laughs> A line <laughs> delivered, no doubt, by Poison Ivy. <laughs> as much as I desperately would like that, uh, incorrect. It's from Chiffon Margarine. <laughs> oh, I definitely stood a chance of guessing that. <laughs> Wait, is that also an ad? <laughs> Yeah, I think all of these are ads. Okay. <laughs> Looking through them. Ooh, we've got a classic, I've fallen and I can't get up. Oh, that's for Life Alert, right? Life Alert, baby. Yeah. Um, and all the rest of them are also ads. I'm going to see what the easy category had. Yeah, let's see if do we it. Get more like actual like TV and movie quotes, because those are what's fun. Show me the quotes. Show me the quotes. Oh, Pogs are a Show 90s me. thing? Sorry. It's all before my time. <laughs> I was reading a Swamp oh, Thing Oh, Red, comic. you're going to be so happy. Oh, really? The first quote you need to guess, I'll be back. <gasps> Terminator 2. <laughs> the Terminator, the first one. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. He says it in Terminator as well. <laughs> <laughs> quote number two, I am serious and don't call me Shirley. Oh, is, isn't that from Airplane? It is from Airplane. It's hey. a very funny movie. I've never seen it, but I've seen a lot of memes. It's been a while since I watched it. Uh, probably unsurprisingly, a movie my dad really liked. We watched <laughs> it a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, that tracks. Uh, quote number three, say hello to my little friend. Uh, Scarface? Wait, they're saying it's from Maple Street. What? <laughs> I don't think that's the most iconic source of that know. quote. <laughs> I don't know if that's the most iconic source of that quote either. Hmm. <laughs> uh, question number four. What's nobody that? puts baby in a corner. Oh, fuck. Uh, that's that dancing one. Right? Which one of the two dancing movies do you think it is, Red? Because I know which one of the two dancing movies it is, and I want you to have to Aren't guess. Aren't we in this together? <laughs> What's going on all of a We side? were until we got to a question about one of the two dancing movies, and you have to pick one. Um... Well, the problem is I only remember the one that is Footloose, <laughs> so, but I know it's not that one. Mm -mm. So what is it? 
Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing. Right. Dirty Dancing. Okay, fantastic. Quote number five. They're here. Uh, aliens? No, right kind of genre, but wrong. It's oh, wait, poltergeist. poltergeist. Right. It's, sorry, yeah, creepy yeah, little blonde yeah. girl had me confused. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Quote number six. I'll have what she's having. Oh, fuck. Uh, well, I haven't watched the movie. I haven't even watched that scene because I know what happens in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know what, what movie it's from. Uh, when Harry Met Sally. Right. Okay. Quote number seven, be excellent to each other oh. and party on, dudes. It's Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, dudes. <laughs> excellent, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eight. Oh, hold on. There's a motorcycle going by. Yeah, that's what There's I call the by. choice of a new generation, Passing. dudes. Whoa. They zoom in. Heard that one. Someone's popping off. Um, question number eight. On the other side of the screen, it all looks so easy. Um... I think uh, this Tron? Might... Uh, yeah. That feels like Tron. I mean, my joke answer like was going to be Reboot, but then I was like, wait, what was the Reboot before it was Reboot? No, no, no. <laughs> it was Tron. I know that one's the 90s. It is, it is from Tron. Hey, good job. Quote nine, go ahead, make my day. Oh, fuck. I know this one's This iconic. was an um, actually question. Yeah. <laughs> um, this one was in the movie episode. I remember it. <laughs> well, really mad that it all I remember is that it's from an iconic movie I haven't watched. Uh, it's from Sudden Impact. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't going to get that. My first guess and was going to be last... Die Hard, which I know is a 90s movie. <laughs> <laughs> and the last of the quotes, the last one we have in this category, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Um... To everyone in chat saying Dirty Harry about that last quote, that's what everyone on um actually guessed incorrectly, but the actual uh... answer was Sudden Impact. Dirty Harry quoting but god that's dumb this one was greed for want of a better word is good uh mm -hmm. i'm gonna say robocop <laughs> yeah sure that sounds right yeah why not oh we were both wrong it's wall street oh you know what i feel like we probably could have cold read that one <laughs> <laughs> like their way into that one yeah well. i've been watching i've been re-watching psych recently because I'm on my ongoing quest to watch every single TV procedural in their entirety, and I had to stop watching SVU because it was just getting really depressing. Yeah. Uh, so I switched over to Psych, which is much funnier. Hmm. Um, it's been a fun game of how quickly can I put together the mystery, and the answer is very slowly. Fantastic. <laughs> Do we want to keep doing trivia, or are we good? We can keep doing <laughs> trivia. <laughs> All right, let's see what other kind of categories we got. We got uh, same name trivia. <laughs> We've got uh -huh. the Legend of Zelda trivia. We oh. be okay at that. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's give that one a shot. Intermediate, <laughs> easy, or hard? Let's do hard. Let's see what they got. I'm going to be bad at this. I think it's the only Zelda game I've actually played is Breath of the Wild. I was not a Zelda kid. That's okay. Music has long been a part of Zelda games. Oh, no. What's the first musical instrument you get in the game series? Uh, fuck. Probably an ocarina, right? Like, statistically. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh no, it's so much worse. A recorder is one of the ah! items in the first Zelda game. <laughs> wow. Okay. You well. know the dulcet tones of the recorder? That oh, yeah. That sweet, sweet instrument that every American child is forced to learn to play. Yeah, we all love playing hot cross buns and then nothing else. <laughs> Ziggy, what are you looking at? It better not be the desk you're not supposed to jump on. <laughs> Over my purse, Ziggy. She's gonna get in there with her damp criminal paws. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Cleo is the one um, napping on the stream. Even <laughs> we like we, we stole Cleo from Blue and Cyan, even though neither of them are on the stream. Yeah, Ziggy's <laughs> off camera, rifling through all our papers and stuff, or hiding behind the bookshelf. Hold on, I gotta pick up my cat. I'll be right back. No problem. Hello, chat. Welcome to the Only Red Solo Power Hour. How's everybody doing? I think we're having a pretty good time tonight. The possibilities of switching to just randomly reading Shakespeare could be fun, but honestly, I really like the chaos of trivia. I got the cat in my arms. Ziggy, yes. you want me out? No, yes. Don't bat at the phone. But if you want to say hi, you were screaming 10 seconds ago. Unleash don't. your power. No, she's still wiggling. Okay, okay. bye. <laughs> or sit there in the middle of my chair. It's fine, too. <laughs> the vibes are different. Exquisite. <laughs> okay. 
The Mirror of Twilight is located atop which dungeon? Oh. Um... Uh, it's, uh, it's like the Coliseum or the Arena or something like that. Um, it has a, another, another name, but I don't remember. <laughs> the Arbiter's Ground. Yeah, that's the one. But it is in a Coliseum, so I was still right. <laughs> in terms of the Zelda in-game timeline. Oh, okay. <laughs> place first. What? It's Skyward Sword by design. Skyward Sword, right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that was in the BDG video. Yeah. And we are correct. Thank you, Brian, for <laughs> making us answer this question. It's Zelda correctly. Monopoly. <laughs> uh, one of maybe the best videos ever made on the Oh, yeah. Yeah, can't be beat. <laughs> yep. How many wearable masks are there in Majora's Mask? Oh, fuck. It's like some ridiculous number. You I can know, start like getting five. a lot of them. Well, the, oh, you there are like three main five. ones. There's the Deku Mask, the Goron Mask, the Zora Mask, uh... I think those are the three main ones, but you can get a bunch of others for other things. So it's either three or, like, 40. <laughs> 24. Ah, you know what? That was actually going to be the first number I randomly threw out. Oh, nice. It's yeah. a nice number to say, you know? It is, yeah. A Link Between Worlds introduces two new rods for Link to use. God damn it. What are they? <laughs> Uh, probably Fire Rod and, uh, Ice Rod, I'm guessing. The Sand Rod and the Tornado Rod. Great! Both wrong! <laughs> <laughs> what is the name of the steamship Link uses in the Phantom Hourglass? Ah, uh, what? <laughs> King of Red Lions, why not? <laughs> the SS Linebeck. What? <laughs> I I don't know either, that's just what the answer the says. Okay, fine, yeah, sure, why not? Princess Zelda is named after what author's wife? Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald? Yeah. Really? That that one, I did also know. Huh. F. Scott Fitzgerald, author of The Great Gatsby. Yeah. See? I see you trying to climb up things. <laughs> She's going nuts. Over. Encouraging her crimes. The map in Breath of the Wild yes. is the same size yes. as what city? What? Um... Uh, let's go with L.A. It was designed to be the same size as Kyoto, Japan. Oh, that's kind of cool, actually. Ooh, that's a fun fact. That's yeah. We're learning something. But is that approximately... Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> no, you know what? I don't need to find out if I'm correct. <laughs> <laughs> what game's title in Japanese translates to Steam Whistle of Earth? Uh, that's got to be the train one, right? Is, Steam well... Whistle, that's got to be a train. It what's could that? be, it could be, what, what's, that? Spirit Tracks? Uh, yeah. It could be one. Spirit Tracks, um, but it could also be yeah, some we'll hot see. nonsense. Oh, could also be like, you know what, let's try that one. Yeah. It was Spirit Tracks. Yeah! Yes. My <laughs> transliteration skills grow stronger with their passing hour. <laughs> uh, which game featured a number of cameos from other Nintendo games, particularly from Super Mario games? Oh, uh, uh, it could have been Majora's Mask. That whole thing takes place in like a non-real dimension, like Mario Kart or something. I don't know. I like <laughs> well, the thing is, if we're counting those as Zelda games, then yeah, it's going to be Smash Bros. or Mario I Kart. Consider Mario Kart a Zelda game? I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> Where does it fit in the timeline, though? Why does Indigo sound like the TikTok text-to-speech voice? Uh, thank you for asking, chat. <laughs> <laughs> I used to literally... I'm sorry, I sorry, looked at the chat and I saw someone say that, and I was like, well, I don't have an answer. Uh, I think I just talk in a very AI-adjacent way when I'm doing my radio voice from college. You see, um, it's just a matter of the cadence. It's not that hard to sound like you are not really a human being speaking words. Well, chat already spoiled this. It's Link's Awakening. Um. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, chat. Well, I need to go feed my cat. I'll be back in two minutes. Okay. <laughs> please. That was the end of the Zelda trivia anyway. Perfect. So please hold. And uh, I don't know, do your best Indigo impression while I'm gone. <laughs> Welcome back to Traffic on the Floor with Indigo. We're all having a great time over here today. Let's talk about uh, various movies I've watched and how exciting it is to talk about them for multiple hours at a time while I desperately attempt to keep the conversation on track. Today we're going to be counting down our top 10 scary voices I can do. <laughs> okay. Um, whew. Well, I think we can 
probably keep doing trivia for a hot minute, but we can also switch over to some form of, like, freeform nonsense or, you know, Shakespeare stuff. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Chet, stop bullying her for how she pronounces water. It's completely respectable. <laughs> sorry, just finishing up this pot of delicious oolong tea I made. Or, no, sorry, jasmine tea. It was the Uncle Iroh kind. I'm anyway. going to leave you all in suspense as to whether or not I could hear that impression. <laughs> <laughs> was it good? <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to guess. <laughs> do you? <laughs> Am I? Are Ooh. you? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm really trying to make that the bit, you know? I've been on a couple of these OSP streams at this point, and every time someone leaves, I always say, do your best blank impression. <laughs> And no one else has picked up on it yet. Everyone's always unprepared, and I want you guys to be ready next time. So this is your warning. Perfect. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to stop doing this bit. <laughs> hilarious. On the off chance that you uh, were not listening in, I suggested we could potentially pivot to something else because uh, trivia is fun, but I feel like there's only so much discussion we can really do about each individual mm -hmm. question, which, you know, it is quite fun. It's kind of like the trope lightning rounds I did solo sometimes. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm um, good with whatever. I'm here to chill. Yeah. Uh, just vibing. My cat should chill now as well because she. So we've been. This is. Would you like to know about my cat's feeding schedule? I would love to know about your cat. In fact, since yeah. we're no longer doing just trivia, I am going to start changing the text to what we're talking about. And right now, it's cat stuff. All right, I'm going to close out the trivia questions tab so I don't have to look at it. Uh, yeah. So my cat, her name is Ziggy, and I like her a lot. Um, but she's also a little menace sometimes. And so what she does in the morning is she wakes up my roommate, who is a heart of gold. Uh, to give her wet food, <laughs> and then about like 2 p.m., I give her the first half of her dry food, and at the end of the day, she gets the second half. And that's because when we were giving her all her food at once, she ate it all at the same time, Ah. and she made herself sick. And when we gave her just the wet food and part of the dry food, she ate all the dry food and none of the wet food. So we have to portion it out for her, or else she makes herself sick. <laughs> Goblin. Incredible. Um, yeah, I, I do love her dearly. She is a little idiot. Um... <laughs> I was going on vacation recently, and I, yes, like Ziggy Stardust, I did name my cat after a David Bowie uh, song, and yep. <laughs> I thought it was cute, and also it's great. Ziggy and Cleo have never met. Um, someday they will. Someday they will, maybe. Ziggy is a black cat. I don't know what breed she is. I got her from the shelter. Um, she has a little bit of a crooked tail, which I think is very cute, because they think, like, kid fold her tail or something, because I got mm -hmm. her right around uh, holidays. And so she was likely a someone thing that someone got their kid and then returned to the shelter, um, which is rough, but it's okay now. She lives with two 20-somethings who have um, no children or significant <laughs> others, so they just dote on their cat. Perfect. Uh, it's the ideal scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do. I think that if Ziggy were to be anywhere on this uh, setup, she would be hiding behind the bookshelf because she kind of just blends into the shadows. <laughs> That's my Ziggy five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> Ziggy's great. Uh, I love that in every picture she's in, she looks like she just finished rolling around in a pile of, like, yeah, she sawdust. Yeah, sort of just, like, collects all of the dust in the apartment. Because she is a little black cat. Um, so And she her favorite thing to do is to just completely stretch out across the hallway. Because our apartment's kind of like a hobbit hole. Like, if you go straight back, you see all the rooms, and it's just, like, one hallway. Perfect. Um, Railway apartment. So she likes to make herself, yeah, like a little roadblock mm -hmm. uh but that just means if we haven't vacuumed recently she just picks up dust <laughs> and it's very visible so she starts to look like a really salt and peppery cat really quick every time you post a cute photo of her i like i always just instinctively respond with oh a trash goblin and then five minutes yeah. later i'm like wait is that rude <laughs> my younger brother calls else? her a garbage cat exclusively <laughs> so you're fine perfect fantastic yeah she's a little stinky but we love her oh boy uh, I don't have a real cat, but I do have like a like a cat shaped LED lamp called Mark Ne Anthony. Uh, nice. She's very useful nice. because unlike the other cats on this channel, Mark Ne Anthony glows in the dark. <laughs> well, Ziggy does the opposite, <laughs> which is almost useful in a different way. Yeah. That she blends in. You know, she's a she's stealth mode. Yeah. Which is cool until it's like two in the morning and. Then <laughs> 
You're like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> what is this thing on my bed? That's your cat who's managed to get a rocket raccoon plushie off of the top shelf of your bookshelf and has tackled it to the ground and is now wrestling with it at the foot of your bed. And you're like, what did I just wake up to? Because clearly it's been blood feud that has been going for a while. I feel like owning a cat has to be so good for like generalized anxiety or like, you know, stress about like ghosts or like home intruders or whatever. Because if something's like, fucking up the, the end of your bed you're like oh it's my cat <laughs> yeah it's kind of like um every procedural i've ever watched giving me anxiety versus that i have a cat fighting at night to see which <laughs> one. um ziggy is super cuddly though she's a very friendly cat yeah uh, for as much as she is a little bit of a menace she's also incredibly snuggly and friendly and she's a big lap cat so yes. when I'm, i work from home which is nice because it means i just have like a constant bro <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she's very cute. I also love that every time you, like, pick her up, she's just the lankiest thing I've ever seen. She's a very long cat, yeah. Yeah, I'm really happy that the conversation has gotten to this, because people <laughs> like to listen to me talk about my cat that much in real life, so I'm glad that now we're subjecting the to it. Hey, I but live yeah, vicariously uh... through the pets of my friends, so, like, you know. <laughs> she's very long, which is part of the stretching across the hallway thing. She forms, she covers the whole width, um... <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but her tail is always a little hook-shaped. Yeah, because she's kept permanently crooked. It doesn't hurt her or anything. It's just like a, you know, that's how the injury healed up. Um, so when she's sitting on the windowsill, because he's a big window cat. Yes. You can just have a little like hooked tail hanging down. Very cute. Perfect. Yes, I do enjoy it quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> well, she's very cute, and I'm I'm happy to know so many cats. Uh. Yes. All righty. Let's see. Um. <laughs> what else we got? Yeah. Uh... I don't have any other pets, so <laughs> <laughs> I got some plants. Uh, got a. <laughs> prayer like the the one with the leaves that closing up uh money plant we don't you have that pothos. spider plant that's like taking over your apartment uh i so saw i have a pothos plant and they're really easy to propagate by just like putting them in a bottle i put them in wine bottles full of water and then they just like keep growing right and i kept trying to get rid of them because i was running out of <laughs> shelf space but I, and the plant keeps and the, the like mother pothos keeps growing and it grows i have it on a top shelf it's growing down it looks very cool on my bookshelf um, I actually have two full-size pothos now, um, but I need it to stop growing quite so uh-huh. much. Yeah. Uh, and I'm running out of bottles to propagate it into. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to kill it by mistake, so I've sort of just been in a stalemate for a while now. Yes. Of just, like, infinite bottles of leaves. Incredible. Um, that keep growing. None of the leaves in the bottles die either, so it's just, like, an endlessly self-fulfilling prophecy um indigo i don't want to get you on any sort of track but someone in <laughs> chat did say uh did i miss the stormhawks part of the stream and i i think that you know right. we can make this person's day very easily <laughs> so stormhawks is a show i watched as a child that was very formative to me and if you asked me to tell you salient details about it i probably couldn't uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> But it has come up, I think, since becoming better friends with Red, it has come up <laughs> so much more frequently than it did previously in my life. This isn't even a show that I'm big into. It's just very funny to me how it's, like, it's like wired directly very, into the core of your of brain. It was one of my favorite shows as a kid. I don't think I saw all of the episodes even. No, I mean, um, this is not the kind of show that you need to watch the whole thing to get just yeah, irrevocably no, you hooked the, into. The, opening montage you understand the entirety of the show and what it's about oh yeah uh, but i i remember i it sticks in my brain because when i first started drawing you know how you always have the one show or uh-huh. the one book that you draw fan art for, fan art for for the first time and it's like that's kind of what informs the style you have going forward oh well, for yeah me, it was stormhawks i have very distinct memories of trying to draw like the stormhawk style which is a very chunky yeah early 2000s cgi so it's impossible to replicate that one's not easy to make look good like even in the show (laughs) it's a little dubious a lot of the time rough i've gone back and watched like clips of it here and there since we mentioned it to just like refresh myself and it's like yeah this show didn't look great but to me as a kid i was like they fly around on like sky motorcycles and it's the coolest they live in a Uh, uh, an airship (laughs) and they all just hang out and are besties like yeah i mean that's that, that show, like, rewires your brain if you watch it at the right age. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes I'll, like, look at my current art style. Because I, like, I I don't, I do art for fun. It's, like, a hobby for me. Uh, and, it, and the cartoonier side of it 
definitely has some elements that look distinctly Stormhawks-ish. Like, I can see it still. Yeah. And that haunts me a little bit. Like, I'm like, oh, the way I draw eyes looks an awful lot like <laughs> the way that eyes appear in Full Stormhawks rectangle! <laughs> it's not quite full. I've moved away from full ranked rectangle, but it's it's close. It's a yeah. thin line. Yeah. <laughs> it's close. It's, it's um, so fun. I love being able to tell what was formative for people yeah. in their art style. Because sometimes <laughs> it's like... You can kind of clock like, okay, this person watched a lot of Sailor Moon. Okay, this person grew mm-hmm. up drawing a lot of Disney characters, uh, you know, stuff like that. But sometimes you get like more niche ones. I don't remember the webcomic at this point, but I remember I read part of one where I was like, this person grew up drawing ElfQuest fan art. How novel. <laughs> um, you can just tell. You can just tell. Yeah. Because there's, there's certain like trends across different types of animation and different types of art styles and kind of like pick out some of those trends. Like mm. uh, if you uh, and Sailor Moon and a lot of like the early shoujo animes, well, they look to them, so you can yep, kind of tell yep. when someone grew up drawing like fan art from that, as opposed to like I don't know, Danny Phantom, different art styles. <laughs> Very, <laughs> and you can really tell uh, with especially with Sailor Moon, you can tell if it's anime versus manga because the yeah, shoujo yeah. manga style <laughs> is very, very different. unique. It's like it, it's like it almost entirely uses like negative space like the the way they portray like this is a really luminous or like beautifully shining surface is like just implying the outlines with just like a series of curl like curls and like fine strokes uh and everyone's neck is really long and all that stuff mm-hmm. whereas the anime had a very distinct kind of brightly colored cartoony style um and also i think the fact that usagi makes goofy anime faces a lot kind of <laughs> That's not something you get so much in shoujo manga, yeah. where everything's kind of like... Noir and I have been, I think we've said this before, but Noir from Rolling With Difficulty and I, he'd never seen the show before watching it. Mm. And on Halloween last year, I was staying over his place with a few of our other friends uh, post uh, a wedding we all went to. And <laughs> it was like two in the morning, and we started watching the Sailor Moon, like 90s oh, anime. No. <laughs> and we got like eight episodes deep before anyone dropped off. Oh, God. Uh, but since then, Noir and I have been watching like five episodes a week together. <laughs> Um, to try and catch up before next Halloween so that we can go as uh, the untransformed and transformed sailor, uh, tuxedo mask at the same time. Oh, of like, course. Parties. Classic. Um, but <laughs> classic Halloween move. I'm really excited for it. I'm going to be untransformed uh, Mamoru. Um, I do have the full costume ready. I just need to go pick up some pork buns. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've been moving through it. And honestly, it's it still holds up pretty good. Like, it's a little cheesy at times. It's a, you know, it's a kid show, but it's so fun. I've been, and when it gets yeah. hard, it gets hard. <laughs> I've been, like, meaning to get into it. I just feel like there's so much there, you know? It's it's so foundational to the magical girl genre. It yeah. has to be important. I feel like if you can get through, if you, like, if you watch season one, you've pretty much seen everything you know, need to see to get most of the, like, cultural references. Um, that's, that's sort of where a lot of people's, like, initial understanding of the show came from, because that's mm. the season that most of the U.S. people growing up would have seen right yeah they because they aired the first four seasons originally in the u.s the og dub which i don't recommend listening to (laughs) because it's um bad you can just say it yeah it's bad they change a lot of stuff they take a lot of the gay stuff out which is oh yeah of course it's an incredibly queer show in a lot of ways um yep but the the sub is great and then the newer dub is also quite good um shout out to robbie damon my boy yeah uh, yeah, I, I want to watch the rest of Sailor Moon. I should. It's just the problem is if I don't watch it dubbed, then I have to pay attention to what's happening so the on the screen, and then yeah, that you means could I could probably get away with watching like the Viz Media dub they did a few like a little later in the early two thousands or so because yeah, that one they didn't really change things as much. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's I'd recommend the sub if you're at all interested in getting into it. No, I I, I generally have a rule that if it's an anime that came out before like 2010, I have yeah, to watch it subbed <laughs> or my ears bleed. There's a very, I've been similarly, I've been really reliving my middle school anime phase a lot recently. Uh huh. Start One Piece from the beginning. Oh. Uh, I'm currently at Skypea. Please don't at me for that. I was pre <laughs> when I was current with the series in middle school. I was up to Fishman Island, and I my understanding is that that is also quite far back. Uh, uh-huh. but I've been watching that subbed and I was like I wonder what the dub sounds like because I've never watched it dubbed um, uh huh and I don't like it no <laughs> <laughs> no shade to the voice actors they're doing their best but just like the voices in the in Japanese fit the characters so well and then they don't they don't yeah. in the English it's, you got the you know kind of like the Ash Ketchum effect on Lucy as well everybody um, loves how Ash Ketchum sounds 
<laughs> Nobody uh, ever has yeah. any complaints. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I gotta say though, in terms of like underrated shows that I only recently got into and was kicking myself over for not watching for a while, sadly, we're talking about two. MNT 2003? It's, uh, no, actually. Uh, oh. I, I, no, well, I put that on hold because you were watching it. I didn't want to, like, widen the gap. Uh, no, I mean, I watched the whole thing as a kid. The gap well, yeah, has been wide for a while. But you didn't recognize the Akira bike slide, man. you got to come at it with new eyes. Anyway, so no, <laughs> I, 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 I was, like, sitting at the, I guess, the season one finale when they're about to, like, go back to New York and fight Shredder for realsies. Uh, no, the show yeah. I was going to talk about, and I'm going to put this up on screen because I feel like we probably are going to have some stuff to talk about, is Static oh. Shock. Uh, oh. like the one DCAU mainline cartoon I just fully missed the boat on. Uh, I also missed the boat on Static Shock. I've oh, only seen but like a few scattered episodes of it, and it, it was good when I saw it, but I didn't see it till I was a little older, and I was like not quite in the right that's zone fair. for it. No, it's really good, and like I think I'm in exactly the right zone to be deeply impressed with the stuff they did, uh, <laughs> and just like casually got away with. I think like episode three, like the B plot is. I, that's not even the B plot. That's like the A plot. The supervillain stuff is the B plot. <laughs> is my best friend's dad is fully racist. <laughs> it was like, mm, whoa, yep. buddy. Uh, <laughs> they do a lot in that show. It's really good. I also like how it's a rare case of like hero with good publicity. Like everybody just loves yeah. this kid right out the gate. And like the one time that they <laughs> mess that up, by the end of the episode, it's like that was my evil clone. And they're like, seems legit. You're back in everybody's good graces, kiddo. <laughs> um, I just, I don't know, I really like that, and uh, it's, I mean, it's very tropey, like, y you can you can tell how it's gonna go pretty much as soon as you start any given episode, but there's nothing wrong with that. I think yeah. it's a great example of a lot of the, sh the stuff that it covers. Um, it's just so fun. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a lot to add here, but everything I've seen of it, I've really liked a lot. And uh, at some point, I will go back and watch the whole thing, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. As I mentioned, I've been rewatching all of One Piece. It's yep. kind of an endeavor. Yeah, that, that's sort of that's a full time <laughs> job at this point. Two hundred something <laughs> out of one thousand or so. Yikes! Um, I gotta say though, the uh, so a lot of superhero uh, shows have a mass empowering event in the like the first episode where mm -hmm. like everyone in a certain space get some random superpower uh and sometimes they explain like oh you know it's it's like based on your inner nature or whatever or like you know it's it, it reflects what you are like they did this in smallville where like the meteors that landed in in uh uh smallville <laughs> i guess uh uh are a kryptonite and b give a lot of people random superpowers so everyone who catches wind of clark kent doing superhero stuff just kind of assumes he's one of those <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and the one in Static Shock is, like, a gas leak of some experimental bioweapon, and uh, it's fully random. So the fact that our, our main boy, Virgil, just happens to get, like, the power to control electromagnetism is sheer luck of the draw. And other people, like, fucking melt or, like, turn into, like, ogres or werewolves or just, like, mutate in horrific ways. <laughs> and to their credit, like, I think in the entirety of episode two, he's kind of, like, anxious about... Man, I hope I don't like continue to mutate or melt or something. That would be really freaky. Maybe I should talk to my doctor. And I don't know. It's it's just it's bizarrely like really good and well written. And also, it has such like a it's got like a deceptively brightly colored cartoony style. So whenever they do things like show like handguns, it feels really jarring and weird. <laughs> um, there is a moment in Sailor Moon that feels appropriate to bring up here, and it's the introduction of Chibiusa. Oh right, when she has the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sailor Moon and Tuxedo Mask, the daughter from the future who time travels back in time and falls onto Usagi. Yep. And then pulls a gun pulls on Pulls a gun, which yep. Which is animated like a very different show. Yeah, classic kid from the future gambit. <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> that showed up and Noir and I had to pause the episode because I knew it was coming, but he did not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's a gradient and on one end... There's Trunks showing up from the future, instantly defeating mm -hmm. the bad guy, getting in good with all the main characters, giving them a dire warning, and then leaving. And then on the other end, there's Chibi Uza falling on her mom and pulling a gun on them. <laughs> I don't think any name will ever tra top Trunks for me. I think that's just, like, perfect <laughs> anime character name. I, it's hilarious. I love that. And yet, it feels appropriate. Even as Akira Toriyama got more serious, like, in his storytelling, he never, ever stopped with the dumb name shit. <laughs> Like the first Not to harp on a point, but that's also very similar to what I like about always. Kind of, it's very consistent. Anyway, yeah, but yeah. No, the dumb names on stuff in Dragon Ball and yeah. subsequent Dragon Ball likes is 
chef's kiss. It well, gives but, it that flavor, you know. But also, it's <laughs> it's like a surreptitious little thingy because, of course, you know, when Trucks first shows up, we don't know who this kid is. Although, if you look, you're like, well, he's got Bulma's hair and Vegeta's eyebrows, so uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he honestly, he's an incredibly well designed character, just like visually speaking. Mm-hmm. And his intro is just, mwah. if it if it didn't herald DBZ's long, slow terminal slide into power creep, I'd like it a lot more. Um, yeah, he's a, a character that ostensibly I should should be my easy favorite, but just because of where he appeared in the show, it was like, well, um, he's still my like out of context he's still fave. High I on think the they list. use him very well, uh, sort of like. After that I like first his arc, aesthetic. he's got the jacket. Oh yeah, you know the thing is like they figured the out cut. like oh future trunks <laughs> is so cool. The problem is they also have like present trunks who's like a kid, and unfortunately because Vegeta has a hand in raising him this time, he's kind of a little shit. <laughs> so they they're still like future trunks is the coolest. We gotta you know we gotta keep bringing him back. <laughs> so they keep finding <laughs> reasons for him to continue showing up in like increasingly elaborate outfits. Anyway, <laughs> boy. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. Yes. There's some some good old shows. What do we? I got well. I got you to start watching TMNT 2003. That was big for me. Yeah. You know, you know what? Let's just put that on the screen. Movie. I feel like yeah, we got some. That. Let's yeah. talk about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. A, a, you, if you like the um, Transformers as your like go to <laughs> <laughs> franchise of a certain era, TMNT is mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean TMNT. I, like a lot of things, it's very dependent on which, you know, which version it is. You know, uh, you get a you get a wide spectrum of uh, tones and quality <laughs> with, that, with that show and or comic. Absolutely, uh, I gotta say, <laughs> two thousand three that... is the one I grew up watching, and I think personally, it's the best balance of comedic and goofy, and also gets to do all the fun kind of gritty stuff that the TMNT comics, you know, the Eastman and Laird stuff. Yeah. I think really that's accurate. On. It's, uh, I mean, I as mentioned, I've only seen, like, most of the first season. Uh, it mm-hmm. is quite cool. I, I do like how even when it gets dark, it approaches it very unsubtly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I also like how they sometimes have them, like, narrate the moral of the episode at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> like, rapping, yeah. like, I finally found a guy as angry as me. And I'm like, yeah, I, I okay. have a question, actually. This is only tangentially related. Why is Raphael the only one with... <laughs> If they all grew up in the same sewer, I, I firmly believe that he heard that. it on like on a, on TV and was like, "Yeah, that guy sounds tough. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna model my personality on." And Mikey did the same thing, but with like a surfer dude. Well, yeah, <laughs> and this is this is the version of Timothy where Sam Regal voices uh, Donatello, and he does such I didn't a good job as a kid, and he does such a good job. He's so good at it. But what I also <laughs> like is that the guy who voices Leo is like in a completely different show than anybody else. Completely different <laughs> He's show. Full Leo anime is fully protagonist. Off having like a whole other arc. <laughs> Everyone I, else is doing something completely different. I think that's the best way to do that character. You know. Yeah. It gives Leo something to be interesting about, because otherwise he's just kind of the turtle that doesn't have a thing. So it's nice. <laughs> no, he he's the leader in blue. Person. Does anything? He's the leader. I know, <laughs> Red. I know he's the leader in blue. But what is a leader in blue if not just the boring character? There's a reason that Leo Whoa. is nobody's favorite. Hey. <laughs> and in 2003, well, they give him stuff to do, and then he can actually be. But like, okay, if you ask anyone of the poll the crowd favorite ninja turtle you're gonna get a lot of michelangelo's you're gonna get a lot of donatello's you're gonna get a lot of raphael's yeah you're not gonna get a lot of leo's <laughs> <laughs> you could i like that he has two swords and i especially like that the choreography of the show does not allow him to hit anybody with them no <laughs> because it's a children's cartoon from 2003 and therefore they weren't allowed to show a lot of bloodshed <laughs> no not even like he like the sword not has to hit blood. other swords that's yep. it and it's even better when they bring in usagi my boy uh, ah, yes. who also uses swords <laughs> so they'll be like fighting back to back against bad guys and like they'll be doing nothing and then they'll start slinging punches and suddenly they're winning <laughs> I'm like yeah. oh if only these swords worked <laughs> I, on people I fear I may have angered the Leo stands in the chat I don't Aha. dislike Leo but you can't deny that he's not the best of the four <laughs> statistically Raph would agree <laughs> aggressively <laughs> as a Raphael fan <laughs> I think that Leo's overrated and maybe the other guy should be in charge. Hey. 
okay. <laughs> with the, that's what they did in a, I haven't watched the newest cartoon, The Rise of the Team and T, but apparently my understanding mm. is they made Raph like more of a himbo. Which this touches on actually, Red, can we transition into a topic I care yes, about? Yes, yes. Let me uh, uh, let me let me let me <laughs> put the highly specific the thing I know you're uh <laughs> The himboification of early two thousands red lancers is it's gotta stop. We need we need more angry dudes. We have an unbalanced Oops. there's there's a lack of ba- I like look, I like There we go. I'm gonna get this is gonna get really off but I really, I like a good himbo. Uh huh. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. them. We all remember the tier list. But the red themed angry lancer was a stock character that was consistently my favorite. Yeah. And they bring a certain important uh, counterpoint to their team comps that we are sorely lacking in modern cartoons. Yeah. Well, and like, so- and this happened to Leo or to Raph and to Knuckles, <laughs> notably, <laughs> in yeah. their like, reboot cartoons where now they're kind of like bigger and dumber. Yeah. And they've lost some of the anger, but they're still like the strong guy. Cause the, no, Knuckles is the easiest one to point to because mm-hmm. my under I've seen some sonic boom out of context and pretty much all of it is just Knuckles saying things. I'm like, that ain't Knuckles. <laughs> That's a funny dude. That ain't Knuckles. The yeah. Agenda, though. I mean, the thing is like now that Sonic 2 is out and he's given us an yeah. exquisite version I'm, of Knuckles. That's basically just Drax the destroyer, back but like, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's strong do and he doesn't get metaphors. Hell yeah. They can be dumb. They just have to also be angry. And I think that, that we've lost that rage, you know, yes. that like, just like, I'm going to charge head first into battle because I have rage inside of me as opposed gonna to I'm going to charge head first into head battle on. because I, I don't have any thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if it was an archetype in Girl Chan in Paradise, you know it was something good. <laughs> um, but uh... <laughs> I, I, why, why do they keep doing this to my red laser? <laughs> Stop I, it. <laughs> I think the thing is like they hit on something that is good but they didn't realize that like it works better when you have a fully balanced party comp. Um, yeah. Because you know, it, traditionally, when you have an angry red themed lancer type, uh, they have sort of this like rivalry going with the main guy. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's the, that's a lot of the appeal yeah, is that, that like good, good drama. Yeah, yeah they're like they're second best, but they're so pissed. And like, if there's any sort of like a lot of times you'll have like the main guy has some kind of like just generalized power and the the red guy has some kind of like specifically fire themed power. It, it they they don't mm-hmm. exactly play subtle with this. And this is important because having this kind of lancer just produces the incredibly easy party conflict of like why are you the leader, man? Maybe I should be the leader. Maybe I don't like taking orders from you as the leader. Just like there's a whole wellspring of that specific kind of thing. And I feel like the last time I saw that in its purest form was in the 2011 Thundercats Nobody But Me watched. Um, yeah. Oh, I remember that show. Cause that was yeah. their, Cartoon Network had a slate of shows in like 2010 to 2012. Because that was when like Symbionic Titan and yes. Generator Rex was on. And I only, <laughs> similar to Stormbox, I have distinct memories of watching these shows, but I could not tell you a salient detail about them. But I do remember the Thundercats reboot that yeah. came out at that time. As well. And it had, uh, it had, it had Tigra um, as the, Tigra. Uh, honestly, I thought they did a pretty interesting job with that because the whole thing was basically like, well, I was the crown prince until the biological son came along and suddenly he's the crown mm-hmm. prince and I'm second best. So the only way I can maintain my ego is by beating him at literally everything except being the chosen one. So you get this interesting you know balance. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. You know who else this kind of happened to? Not yeah. red themed, but also and debatably not a Lancer, but Kevin Levin from Ben 10 yeah! into Alien Force got dumber. <laughs> he's not dumb in Alien Force. He's, he's not street smart. the dumbest of dumb. But he, it's just, if you look at the, like, if you go back to OG Ben 10 and then you go to Alien Force, something changes in the middle. Well, that's and fair. That, I'm all for it. I, Kevin Levin is my favorite in that show. I haven't but. watched OG Ben 10 because it's a little too kiddy for me, unfortunately. Uh, but I grew up on that. Yeah. yeah. I haven't rewatched it in a long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that Kevin Levin and Alien Force is quite different, but, like, I don't mind him because I just, I adore yeah, what I they did with him and Gwen. Of, like, it's like one of the only yeah. romantic subplots I actually like and understand. <laughs> I think he's an example of how to do this well, because first of all, there's not as much of like a dynamic in the team that's established because he wasn't really part of the OG Ben 10 team. Mm. So when they go to Alien Force and he becomes like a consistent part of the team episode to episode. Yeah, he's the only one who like can drive. Showing up to be an antagonist. Yeah, yeah. they needed someone to drive. <laughs> You know, he gets to make a new dynamic, and I love him for that. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the thing that, get, that gets me with, like, Knuckles and Raphael is that they have already such a deeply established dynamic. And when you break up that dynamic, the whole team comp gets broken down, and suddenly it might not work quite as well as it did in previous iterations, even yep. if the writing is better or the show is a different tone. It's just, like, 
it gets me. Yeah. And so I like angry characters. I don't know if you can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? But no, you're right. I mean, I think one thing about, you know, the the, the established, this red-themed Lancer with an angry vibe becomes a himbo. Basically what that means is that there's no longer any conflict between them and the main character. Because yeah. the, the premise of this specific form of Lancer turned himbo is that they are essentially so good-natured and dumb that they do not really have any sense of personal ego. Like, they don't take slights personally, they don't fly off the handle, they don't overthink things and wind themselves up, which is one of the primary features of these angry boys, is that they mm -hmm. they overthink things, you know, they, that like, half of the time they have a grievance against the main character that's actually a grievance against themselves, uh, which yeah. is just, wow, these characters are so fun, because <laughs> they're just like little bundles of pure white hot self-loathing, just waiting for somebody to, like, put a blanket on yeah. them and be like, hey, you we're cool, them, actually. You love to watch them crash and burn you yeah know? because then afterwards like, their friends will be explode. like friendship and they'll be like oh yeah. fuck <laughs> so the most infuriating character if they're actually alone the whole time the best part of a five-man band if they're in one <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> or four-man band or what have yeah you. but then the thing is when you take good the good thing about a lancer is really all they need is one other character to play off of but it does help if they have a, a broader support network mm -hmm. uh and this dynamic is so juicy because it allows for easy inter-character conflict because a lot of times when you have all the heroes on the same side like you kind of need to work to make them fight. Like, you got to contrive it. Maybe someone gets brainwashed. Maybe there's some, like, mm -hmm. angry pollen in the air. Who the fuck knows? Um, but when you have this... <laughs> like excuse me. God damn it. When you have this guy around, he's, like, this, like, simmering cauldron of resentment uh, and, and, like, mm -hmm. insecurities. I mean, I guess the hip new thing for that is My Hero Academia. Uh, the oh, yeah. The entire vibe of Bakugo. I understand he's sort of... Not chilling out, but, like, becoming slightly more mentally stable in recent chapters, which is good. Uh, yeah, but... my understanding is I'm not completely caught up. I've been watching anime, only, but the spoilers I've seen from the manga is that the stakes have gotten so much higher than we're in high school and villains sometimes attack. To, like, I don't even fucking know what's happening. I feel like it but, has uh... to be coming up on the finale. And... I love it. The is, art. I think the, I remember, but from what I've seen, I, from the, the kids on TikTok, it is right. coming up on its finale well, in the next good. year or so. But. I guess the thing is, like, I like the art, but also there are so many speed lines half the time that all I know is that there's a direction of motion <laughs> involved. I don't know what the fuck is happening. And the fact that Bakugo's power is explosions does not help. <laughs> no, no. Anytime he's in panel, I'm like, is that an eye or hair or just part of the background vibes? Anyway, um, <laughs> ah, chat person, yes, Kuwabara, the example from uh, Yu Yu Hakusho, I think is actually an interesting case because he's sort of in the exact halfway point between angry rival with an inferiority complex and himbo because he mm. is both of those things because he's very stupid. <laughs> and for some reason, Chris Savitt voices him like a like a cartoon basset hound like he's got oh, no. he's he's doing like a like yusuke has a perfectly respectable shonen protagonist voice and he and karama sound fine and then there's kuwabara being like uh, but you're a meshi what are we supposed to do now and i'm like oh god <laughs> you can just talk normally it's <laughs> fine he doesn't sound like this go in back Japanese. and watch you you, have to show it you gotta I, well because here's i've read your influence continuing i watched three <laughs> seasons of inuyasha and i was like I yes I, enough of this to underst I understand the deal i'd seen scattered episodes Similar thing that like a lot of the shows have said. I've seen scattered episodes as a kid. I got the general vibe. I've watched three seasons. I'm like, yeah, this was fun, but I don't have a nostalgia for it, so I just kind of put it dead aside. To continue watch watching season four, though, that's the Band of Seven two. arc, which is probably the best uh, arc overall. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe at some point. No. Uh, but I feel similarly like Yu Yu Hakusho. I should probably go back and watch at some point. Fine. I've seen scattered episodes, and I know the general vibe, but I. What I will say to, to try and sell you on season four real quick uh, is that um, uh -huh. <laughs> it's got it, it's got a couple things that I, I personally thought were high points in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of those things is uh, th that show kind of peaks anytime for any reason Inuyasha has turned human because uh, yes. then he's actually vulnerable <laughs> for a change, but he never, ever acts like it. <laughs> so he immediately gets his ass beat and then needs like help. And because he is basically the red themed Lancer of his own story. Like, mm -hmm. that's just a golden arc. Uh, and season four involves a sacred mountain that purifies demons. And he's like, it's fine. I'm half demon. And then he starts running up the mountain. And he's like, oh, this actually sucks really bad. Um, <laughs> spends a lot of that stuck as a human in a bad situation. And the other yeah. thing is there is a point where all the other characters are in severe peril. And Inuyasha is forced to admit to himself that he actually deeply cares about all of them and is very, very bummed that they might be dead. Um, so, you know, yeah. just it's it's good for the uh, the emotional... The emotional arc. Uh, 
I've said yeah, it times. As far as like Koga being introduced, and I was like, uh, well, why do we not have? Why is this guy not in every episode? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew you'd be a Koga <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is running around. You want Kiki? Kiki. The Koga's over here being like, ah, oh, Wolfman. <laughs> 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 I'm I mean, you're so right. <laughs> I'm not fighting you on this. I think what... I don't have the nostalgia of the like designated like couple, and I'm like, I don't know, man. Koga's looking like a pretty good option right now. <laughs> well, I have great news for you about a major player in season four. <laughs> oh boy, it's yeah. my boy. It's your boy. <laughs> Hell yeah. He even gets a little tender hurt comforting because he gets exploded by a tank. <laughs> well, that's not ideal. <laughs> no, he's fine. He gets Kigome to take care of him. <laughs> And oh, he and Inuyasha butt funny. heads a lot because, you know, you know, the old like, oh, it's not like I actually like you or anything, but I'm going to go make yeah. sure that no bad. Yeah, they, they kind of have that dynamic because he got his ass beat. So Inuyasha's like, all right, you stay in the cave with this useless wolf guy. I'm going to go fight that scary bad guy <laughs> and probably die. Have fun. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, my boys are hanging out. So I don't know what took over me for a second there when we were talking about Koga, but my inner <laughs> Charlie Day really came out for a second. <laughs> well, if it makes it's you feel better, deep inside. shipping Koga and Kagome is like by far the most popular fanship that isn't the main one. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That tracks. That's, that's watching the show. I'm like, oh, yeah, I bet people really like this. Too. <laughs> yeah, he's great. <laughs> Uh, and oh, if yeah, you watch yeah. it uh, dubbed, that's the same voice as uh, Wolverine from uh, X Men yeah. Evolution. So I have been watching it dubbed. Yeah. I well, I had been watching it dubbed because I was drawing while I was watching it. I didn't want to look at the subtitles, which yeah. means I've been getting all of that ooh juicy, juicy <laughs> of ancient what, whatever accent it is that a lady is supposed to. Have. Oh, Kaede, the fact that she or talks like a Shakespeare character and nobody else does. <laughs> Yeah, what's up with that? I don't know. I don't know why she talks like that, especially not when Inuyasha's 200 years older than her, and he talks like a normal human being. I don't get it. None of the other characters from that time period say ye. It's no. just her. I, I don't understand it. Was it a choice it. that they made? Kikyo doesn't either, and they're related, so my guess is that Kaede is just doing it to fuck with Kagome. <laughs> She read, like, one Shakespeare play, and she's like, ooh, I bet I can make this my whole person. Yeah, she found it in Kagome's backpack and was like, ooh, interesting. <laughs> oh, oh boy <laughs> yeah oh yeah 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 oh man right. okay let me just un unwind from that <laughs> the, yeah come down some things that. that you like that you ever hyper fixated on like they just kind of sit in your head there's this little yeah. knot of serotonin and every time you go back to it it's like you're like trying to plug a power outlet into the surface of the sun you know just like <laughs> <laughs> so Oh, I feel that way about TMNT 2003 sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but getting back to the topic we have on the board, I think... Yes. Um, Red theme Lancers becoming yeah. himbos is bad, actually. Well, the fact is, like, there is so much unique, like, good conflict you can get by having a really good, like, fiery, pissed-off Lancer type. As mentioned, you know, there's a reason that mm -hmm. uh, Inuyasha is one of my favorite characters of all time. Um, yeah, and, uh, everyone loves a Lancer. Yeah, and everybody loves a character who has an easy reason to have conflict but maybe not like serious conflict because mm -hmm. you know th th there's like a gradient here there's you know there's minor squabbles there's casual you know ribbing a lot of characters have kind of a fun confrontational dynamic but sometimes it escalates you know like sometimes some shit goes yeah. down and then the characters have to fight for real which is something i really liked about i want to say the 2008 3d animated tmnt movie um, oh with the one with the yeah uh, chris evans is <laughs> yeah the one with chris evans <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that movie is. I haven't watched it in a long time when that came out. So, you ever how you used to own movies on iTunes? Like <laughs> you would pay like five bucks and then they'd be added to your iTunes library. So, my, I, me and my younger brothers, big Team T fans, we owned the 2008 Team T movie on iTunes and yep. I have not watched it since I last opened up iTunes. <laughs> Yeah, but every once in a while I think about it and I'm like, man, I think that movie might have actually been good. It's it or was I really fondly remember. <laughs> I watched it recently. It's good. Also, shout out to the the back to back comments in chat. One of them saying Razor, the other one saying My Honor, <laughs> because yes, <laughs> those are both accurate. Yes. Those are both accurate yes. for Red Theme Lancers. That would be bad if they were dumb. Uh, mm -hmm. because you need that good conflict and you need that sort of like you never know if they're just sort of like butting heads or if something is seriously wrong. Uh. And that, that can also yeah. be fun for the rest of the party, because if you have this red-themed Lancer type who's, like, always sort of antagonistic, but you never know if it's like, okay, are they just kind of fucking with us, or is something actually wrong, are they becoming a bad guy again, or something like that, um, 
there's all kinds of fun stuff you can do. Razor is great for that because he spends the first like eight episodes being like, I'm a Red Lantern, I'm evil, you all shouldn't trust me, let me prove it by blowing up the ship. And then it turns out he actually just artfully sabotaged the ship so he looked like he blew it up for long enough that he could go and fight the bad guys single-handedly, which is a classic pissed-off Red Themed Lancer maneuver. <laughs> Yes. It never goes well uh, for them. It means that the others have to rescue them and teach them the power of friendship, which is just ideal. Um, but turning these guys <laughs> dumb basically means that they no longer cause or contribute at all to inter-party conflict. Like, if, mm. if they get too himbo-fied, they are just there to be funny and, like, gentle punchlines. Yeah, and if they do cause conflict, it's inadvertent and you don't get any of that good, good, like, character development from it. Because yep. it's usually just a comedy of errors as opposed to being a comedy of intent. Exactly, yeah. Um... And the thing is, like, you can totally have a himbo in a party and an angry red-themed lancer. In fact, this is very common mm -hmm. when the himbo is the big guy and the lancer is the lancer. Like, this, for a yeah. while, that was the standard format. You'd have, like, the fun, jovial big guy and the pissed-off red-themed lancer type. Not to, not to uh, trample on the uh, long, irradiated ground of the Voltron reboot, but that was the original <laughs> party comp. You had Shiro in charge, yeah. you had the angry red-themed lancer and Keith... And you had mm -hmm. Hunk as the big guy. Uh, yeah. And he was gentle and fun and a total himbo. So. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, so oh, I so I uh, just to go back to the 2007 CG's cast. Yes, Chris Evans chat was Casey Jones in that movie. Yep, yep. And Nolan North <laughs> and was Raph. Patrick Rath. Stewart was the villain. <laughs> he was. He did a great job. But I got to say, like, Patrick Stewart's voice coming out of a guy who looks that young feels weird. <laughs> I had a similar problem watching, um, I watched, for Movies Jack, we watched uh, Flushed Away, and I think hmm. it's, is it Patrick Stewart or Ian McKellen who's in that, who plays the villain? I think it's Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Ian McKellen um, has Flushed Away. Nope, it's Ian McKellen no! who is the toad in Flushed Away, God. and it does not sound like <laughs> It's nuts. It took me so long into watching that movie to like will make my brain willingly acknowledge that I knew who was playing that role, hmm. and that it was her, Ian McKellen. Oh and God! I mean, shout out to that guy. Job. He always gives one hundred and ten percent to whatever he's doing. Oh yeah, yeah. Those those two nervous. I similarly did X two recently with uh, Nando B yes. movies. We were talking. Yes. So was like I would just watch hours of those two playing off each other and just bickering. <laughs> they put yeah. so much of themselves into every role. It's just great. Um, oh, man. Uh, but, yeah, sorry. I also saw chat point out that uh, Catra and Scorpia are another red-themed Lancer versus Himbo situation. Where yeah. it's like you got, yeah. the, you got the angry Lancer whose loyalty is maybe a little bit dubious even after she joins the side of good, and then you got the big good-natured hugger type. And it's like it's important to have both of these around. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they both fill important roles in the story. The, the Himbo is like a nice soft cushion. And the Lancer is like a firework that sometimes randomly starts going off. Yeah. Yeah. I love a good himbo. Yeah. But you need to make sure that you also have some of that gritty, angry, fiery John going off on the side to make sure that you get a little balance. You can't have, if too sweet is too sweet. You too know? sweet is too you sweet. Need a little spice. Yeah, it's very important. And the Lancer is so good for that. And I just don't understand why they don't include that. Because... Yes. In, in conclusion... Bring back my angry red themed lancers. Yes. <laughs> let them be. Let them be mad again. That's why I'm so Knuckles glad. Knuckles is getting his little rebound in yep, Sp yep. Sonic too. Was, you know, well they they cast Idris Elba, so we knew out the gate he wasn't going to be himbo again. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, they are sort of leaning into the like the they're kind of making him basically wharf, where it's like he's not dumb, but he doesn't yeah. understand social norms, uh, mm -hmm. which is fine. I think that that's a great proud warrior race guy archetype. And now that they're bringing in. My boy Shadow to be oh, no. the real edgy red theme so, lancer. I feel like we gotta switch our topics to fan casting Shadow the Hedgehog. Okay, right? like that's gotta be the move. <laughs> we <Let me> just <laughs> this Shadow the, the Hedgehog. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh yeah. God, I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> there are so many ways this could go badly, but I'm so excited. Yeah, I think it fully depends. Like, do how? Because you know. Casting Idris Elba as Knuckles was such a curveball to me the moment <laughs> I realized that it had happened. And also it made me enormously happy as a human being. His so I'm hoping that they kind of follow the, that. The tweet with the with picture the of the knuckles. glove. <laughs> I was like, this is a joke, right? This is like Nerdist I or something. This is a cracked was a, I was being punked. I was like, where <laughs> were the cameras? And then he straight up killed it. And it turned out uh, Knuckles the Echidna's real backstory is that he's desperately lonely. And I was like, yes, good. Yeah. <laughs> Teach him friendship. Say what do you will about Idris Elba. That man has never given less than 100% in a role. Oh, 100%. Every time I see him, I'm like, 
Idris Elba's killing it, even though he is an objectively a questionable piece of media. Sonic <laughs> 2 was great, but he was also in Cats, and we need to not forget that. Well, um, yeah, he did give 110% to Cats. He did, and Cats gave him nothing in return. No. That's not his fault. That's on Cats. Cats just uh, CGI'd <laughs> him to look up- upsettingly unclothed. <laughs> yes. Somehow more naked than every other cat in that uh, all at once. Yeah. Um, but anyway, fan casting Shadow the Hedgehog. Uh, spoiler alerts. Um, What's you up? Know, for, sorry, someone was, please don't spam the chat. I oh, will yeah. time you out. I was also going in there to time out the Spooderman guy, but good job. <clears throat> so I feel like we got a fan cast Shadow. Like, who do yeah. you think should voice Shadow the Hedgehog in Sonic 3? Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is, it, they're kind of doing celebrity stunt casting, but so far they've done a pretty good job of stunt casting actors mm-hmm. who can actually, like, voice act, which is pretty rare. Um, so I'm sort of torn because it would be nice to cast, like, an experienced voice actor who mostly mm-hmm. does that. But on the other hand, I think it would be so fun to have Chris Evans. <laughs> I do think it'd be very fun to have Chris Evans <laughs> and, like, be Shadow. The thing is, Chris Evans is both. He is an experienced voice yeah. actor and was before he became, like, a, a screen acting heartthrob. So I think that could be very think- fun. And it's a, the best it's option, too, concept. is he does the 2007 Casey Jones voice in Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> not Shadow the Hedgehog. No, I agree. He's, he's got pretty good voice acting chops for a screen actor. Yeah. Um, so if they're going to go the celebrity stunt route, he's probably like the lawful good option. Yeah, and that he would do a good job funny. and is also someone you could parade on the red carpet and be like, yeah. look, it's that guy. Look, <laughs> check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who else would be a good option, though? I mean, there's... Kevin Conroy think, like... as Shadow would be pretty hardcore, but mm. I don't know if it would work. Yeah. Like, he's just too good at being Batman. I feel like at that point, you're sort of risking overlap with Idris Elba. You have Idris Elba, which mm-hmm. means you've already got, like, the baritone covered. So I think, yeah. you know... You need a little bit more of, like, uh... What's a good voice type to describe this? <laughs> well, the thing is, you've got Sonic in, like, the high tenors. You've got Idris Elba's, like, mm-hmm. low bass. So you need something more mid-range. Yeah. Yeah. There's a specific type of voice I'm thinking of that shows up in character sometimes, and I'm trying to think of a good example of it. It'll come to me eventually, Excuse but me. that it would fit well for this. Hmm. Um, but Shadow the Hedgehog, otherwise, everyone's testing out their fireworks today. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Liam O'Brien would be very funny, but I don't know if he. Cast for the Shadow problem the is Hedgehog. the celebrity stunt cast thing. Like, I, he'd, yeah. he'd do a good job. I just don't know if. They, I don't, I don't think you could slide through the celebrity stunt cast. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Um, oh God, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> Oi. Uh, if people keep recommending people like Henry Cavill and like Keith David, it's like guys, we already have the baritone covered, and you know they probably want to like balance it out. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess my question is, like, Shadow could be anybody. And my, my money's yeah. still on Chris Evans. But who do we get for Infinite the Jackal? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we're three, four more Sonic movies in. Which Sonic character you're going to go for? Because there's so <laughs> many that you could have chosen. I mean... God, you think I wasn't going to go for the electropunk uh, reality warping, my infinite power? <laughs> There was that one that turned into a tree in Sonic X. I don't remember the name. I don't know who, uh, what that is. But come on. Yeah, we all got to respect. That was that was played on four kids in the early 2000s. Ah, the same programming slot that also had the team in 2003. I don't know a lot about Sonic. Uh, actually, I know more than the average person, but not that much more. Because <laughs> I used to read the same like 10 issues or so that were out of order of the like Sonic comic that ran in the 90s where he had like the chipmunk girlfriend. And mm. then... <laughs> I played Secret of the Rings in middle school because our neighbor gave us the Wii game for free at a yard sale. <laughs> and I watched Sonic X as a kid out of order. So everything I know at the universe comes from three disparate sources that do not agree on the lore and have different characters in it. Spectacular. <laughs> so I know the broad stroke. Yeah. But I think that's the best way to consume Sonic uh, media personally. And now the movies, which are great. Yeah. Alan Tudyk is casting I would actually see, but I feel like yeah. the way that they cast him... He'd probably play a like a side character. Um, he'd yeah, do a like, really uh, good Alan job. Alan would come in for like. Um, oh wait, always have that one little dude. They love casting Cosmo. him as robots. He could be that Omega yeah. robot. Um, <laughs> he'd do a good job. <laughs> and then he could do robots. all the little animal background noises as well. <laughs> yes. Oh. oh man. Dante Bosco mm-hmm. as Shadow. I, 
I I could see happening. Mm-hmm. And I mean no disrespect, but I kind of hope they don't do that. <laughs> it would just be a little too Zuko for me, you know? Yeah. A little. Uh, the Dante Basco is one of those voices where you hear it and you Dante Basco. I feel like you have to have someone who will kind of uh, dissolve into Shadow the Hedgehog. Yeah, <laughs> they have yeah. to become one with the Hedgehog. Or they need to do such a spectacularly bad job that that's all anybody can talk about. Yeah, exactly. There's only two ways this Ooh, can go. Sean no Astin might actually like do a good job with hmm. that because I know he played uh, Raph in I think like the early 2010s 3D animated Ninja Turtles cartoon. Yeah. And I remember being baffled that that was Samwise Gamgee until there was one bit where he did like a quick inspiring speech and I was like, oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. You couldn't hear him underneath the accent. Uh, he's like, don't you give the up on me. And I was like, oh, there it is. Part of Raph's characterization. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Yeah. So many options, but a lot of them are terrible. <laughs> I really think the problem is we hit it out of the park with that first one because I think yeah. Chris Evans is the it's gotta best be Chris possible. Evans. Although I gotta it's say, gotta the, Chris, the person right? in chat saying Jackie Chan, uh, all the love in my heart for Jackie Chan, but his English voice work has never been his strong suit. <laughs> mm. uh. Okay, let's see. Yeah, no, I, I'm i teamed Chris Evans for Shadow of the Hedgehog. Get it trending Hell on yeah. Twitter, kids. <laughs> you tag me in it, it's fine. I've got nothing to lose at this point for the amount of people who have <laughs> added me in Tony Hawk's DMs that I feel like What's Boy. one more celebrity that I'm never gonna be? Oh <laughs> uh, no. Okay. I think I think that's probably about as far as we can take the Sonic uh, fan casting. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. If we don't, I think we've, we've we just we did too good. You yeah, know? we did. Yeah, we we, we nailed so it right good, out the gate. We just had nowhere else to go. Chat. We're, we're not saying that Matt Mercer is not as good as Chris Evans. We're we're trying to be realistic here. Like yeah, this movie they got Idris Elba in the second movie. <laughs> They... Noir texted me uh, Seth Rogen, which feels like ah! um, intentionally aggressive. Pain. So Noir, how dare you? Um, do you want to talk about rolling with difficulty though? Since we we're oh yeah, we can do that. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Let me just uh, on, change just the not... text real quick. <clears throat> Smack my headphones into the ah! mic. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Red and I are on a Dungeons and Dragons actual play podcast yeah. called Rolling with Difficulty, which just started season two yesterday yeah right? no two days ago <laughs> two days ago i don't know what day of the week it is oh, oh god it's sunday yeah it's sunday. um <laughs> yeah friday uh the first episode of season two came out and <laughs> it's been a blast recording it so far but we've just been uh we've just we've got 10 episodes coming out over the next 10 weeks or so um and season one is all already existing and the podcast has just been an absolute blast and also yeah. red's been playing D with me which is really fun yeah um and I play an angry, previously red-themed, now blue-themed <laughs> character on the show. So if you've been listening to this and you've been like, w- put your money where your mouth is, Indigo, I'm trying. I'm yeah. trying real hard. <laughs> the problem is everyone in the party likes each other, so you don't have anybody to, like, yell at. <laughs> or I fight. know, I need, an, I need an angsty rival. Yeah. And my potential angsty rivals all keep just dying. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if one of us dies and rolls a new PC, we can have a real proper mm. proper rivalry oh, going. Oh, no. <laughs> <Don't even joke. laughs> I've spoken it into existence. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah but it's it's a lot of fun um yeah how's how's the season two launch been for you red because i've been having a blast uh, it's been fun i do all the editing so i've been yeah. recovering from editing the first episode in preparation for polishing the second yeah i've just been sitting around not doing work on it so it's been nice i've been <laughs> uh refreshing all the tags and like posts and stuff like that on twitter and tumblr waiting for new fan art to roll in <laughs> <laughs> the response yeah, time for a multi-hour D and D podcast is unsurprisingly a little bit slow. Um, yeah, <laughs> Chad's fun. just I mean, saying, "Rip Egan." Yeah, Rip Egan. Uh, yeah, spoilers for the end of season one. Even then, um, that wasn't a great rivalry. He was too much of a wet blanket. <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, well, the people do love him. Yeah, which yeah, they do. Go nuts. Drag people people also love Blue Danny a lot. Uh, <laughs> I just want to assure our listeners out there that I will not intentionally turn Danny back from Blue anytime soon. I, co- I wouldn't do that to you guys. You no. care too much. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's too, too iconic now. I can't change it. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. There was something. Oh, yeah, sorry. The person asked, uh, season two, uh, is it a new campaign? And it is not. It is a continuation of the previous no. campaign. There's been a bit of a time skip, but uh, if you want to understand what's happening, you should listen back through season one, which is all on yeah. YouTube. So, like, well it worth is. it. It's on YouTube and uh, all other podcast platforms. Yeah. Uh, we've started... So season one, we crossed, didn't initially cross-post to YouTube. We were just releasing audio only. 
Uh, so it's just the audio uploads. But season two, uh, the combat maps are up in the YouTube uploads. So if you were a kind of person who likes to be able to see just like a rough layout of what we're looking at on Roll20 during the episode, you can mm -hmm. see that during the VODs. Um, you know, still no one's face or anything, but it's just a little bit more of a video element. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a blast. And it's very it's an episodic show, in theory. There's a bit of an overarching plot to it, uh, to, like little arcs that we go through. But every episode is its own job and its own adventure. So if you're the kind of person who wants to jump in just one episode to see if the adventure is fun, I highly recommend episode two yes. or episode one. Go nuts. But episode two, we do a train heist in hell. And I, I love that one. Episode so two. <laughs> episode two. two, he sends us to a two. Vernus. <laughs> Our DM said, what if we went to hell? <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. The campaign is searchable by, sorry to everyone asking, rolling with difficulty. It's on screen now. Uh, just search for that on YouTube or a podcast platform and it'll pop right back up. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. I'm looking forward to recording more of season two. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, so I... Yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, I don't want to say anything. Yeah, we can't say anything. But um, uh, I, I will say, not spoiling anything, season one is very heavily, like, the overarching plot is strongly anchored to my character's backstory, yeah. which was deeply stressful. <laughs> um but now with season two, I get a break, and it's everybody else's dark, traumatic backstories that's coming to the yeah. forefront, which is great. So now I can finally relax and just be the, the supporting character I've always dreamed of being. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, in the first episode of season two, we do an adventure themed around uh, Binbar, the, re the yes. her Asper's resident chef's whole background, which has been very fun for me because I also wrote basically nothing for my backstory, <laughs> so getting to experience someone else's thing. Before I have to figure that out, it's been a blast. It's fantastic. And I also got to shout out Noir uh, because his word economy for Virla is incredible. <laughs> it'll just be like nothing, nothing. And then it'll just be like, does it mean anything that you didn't invite former love interest to this party? And it's like, what? <laughs> oh, it's incredible. Noir is um, a DM of a home game that Austin and I are also in. Um, and... It getting to see him as a player as opposed to the dm is very fun because i'm like i can see the dm threads <laughs> you see the themes uh, it's, and it, it's a blast and he plays uh the robot wizard virla virla yeah delightful he now has a stylish BFF. hat he does he's a wizard's hat now it's so sweet and pointy he is um really locking in the look and i've loved all the fan art of him yelling at the space dm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we rolled luckily on that one to not get uh, fined more <laughs> by them mm -hmm. Arcadian cops. So, yes, yes, it's fantastic. Uh, I also, uh, this isn't related to that, but I've, I've nearly finished my watch through of EXU Calamity. Um, oh, it's just so good. It's very depressing. I mean, that's the point. <laughs> like, I, it's kind of interesting Look, seeing... Calamity. Well, yes, but it, it's interesting seeing what Brennan Lee Mulligan is like when the gloves are off, you know? <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. there are some things that DMs don't do in regular games. Uh, I'm just going to change the text to D&D &D because I feel like we're probably going to be talking a little more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and the person in the chat asking how far ahead of time do we record episodes. It depends. Sometimes uh, like a month before, usually two months, but yep. fairly far in advance. Um, yeah. Because we give you time to I do all edit. the post-production. Um, and I'm one human being who has other jobs. Yep. <laughs> it yep. takes a while. Uh, but... Uh, so the yeah, the clammy thing, like I'm I'm nearly through it. The thing is, like the final episode is obviously when all the shit hits the fan and everything starts getting mm -hmm. real tragic. So like I've been sort of working through it. Like after I was stuck watching it, like riveted to the screen for the first two hours before they resolved some stuff, I was like, I gotta get out when I can. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but one thing that I think is interesting is uh how Brandon Lee Mulligan uses the holes in certain characters' backstories. Um, and one mm -hmm. example of that that I thought was incredibly interesting is uh, Marisha Ray's character, Pesha Porco. Um, her whole thing is the legacy of her grandfather, who's the elf wizard that raised this city into the sky in the first place. So she's got like a big mm -hmm. legacy to live up to. She works very hard maintaining the, like, the, the perfection of this city. And mechanically, her main thing is memory, like storing hers, modifying other people's sometimes, like stuff like that. She does a lot of that stuff. She's... They have her as, like, she's the keeper of the scrolls, but really it's like she's kind of running, you know, like, the secret, you know, the, how to describe It's not like the secret police, because she doesn't have anything as, you know, clumsy as, like, physical uh, <laughs> enforcement of her will. It's just like, yeah. you can't know that, so you won't. Stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a bit in episode four where she's, you know, things are going to shit, and she's, like, at the statue of her grandfather. Um, 
and Brandon Lee Mulligan says something to the effect of, do you think you removed your own memories of your parents or do you think your grandfather did that for you? <laughs> and Ooh. Marisha's like, above the table, there was no point in my backstory development where I ever even considered Pace's parents. <laughs> Um, and it's just like, it's just interesting, you know, to see a DM kind of take that little, like that, mm -hmm. that just empty bit and be like, interesting. And then take the vacuum and sharpen it to a knife's edge and file it away for later stabbing. <laughs> just so clever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's an art to that. I think as a, I, I'm usually a player, not a DM. I've DM'd occasionally, but I tend to find that I, uh, get too distracted and I'm not great at running all the numbers and stuff so i'm usually more of a player mm. um but my years of developing dnd characters and even more time of making mock-ups in uh hero forge and never <laughs> playing the character i think it's really important to make sure your character has those blank spots when you give a dm something because you give them a perfect written out here's everything that's happened to the character detailed background yeah um and nothing for them to explore in game yeah you can get mileage out of that, but you're going to have a much better time if you put some little mysteries in there that even you don't know the answer to, because then you have something to discover alongside the other players and with the guidance of the DM in a way that fits the world. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying write no backstory, because I've definitely given DMs a lot of information in the past, but I find the characters I've really enjoyed playing are the ones where I've been like, here's what you need to know to understand who this character is, and here's what this character doesn't know about themselves, and mm -hmm. we can go from there. Yeah, no, I agree. I think... Uh, there are some characters where, like, the backstory really doesn't necessarily matter. There are some settings. There are some DMs that will or won't use that stuff. But, like, <laughs> there's a there's a thing that uh, my parents' D&D group described as uh, donning the coat of plot hooks, which is <laughs> when you make a character whose backstory has, like... <laughs> oh, there's so much terminology here that isn't in, in current use in D&D. It comes from, like, other games. But, um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. for instance, in the system of Champions, which is a superhero game system... Uh, you have essentially a pool of points that you can allocate to things like superpowers when you're, when you're creating your character, and you can get more points by taking on disadvantages. Um, things like you're hunted by this group or, or this person, or like you have this drawback to your powers, stuff like that, uh, so you can mm -hmm. get trade-offs. Uh, the one disadvantage you should never ever take is unlucky, because that one's statted up to basically be the vibe of being Spider-Man in the comics, Everyone you love will die. Nothing I, will ever go your way. Character. You'll be perpetually broken. I would always become lucky. <laughs> yes, I mean, fun. yeah. Uh, but essentially, the vibe is sort of like you can build a character who, like, they have amnesia or, like, <laughs> they're hunted by a mysterious organization or um, they've got this, like, weird power. They don't know where it came from or they're a warlock, but they don't know what their patron is or just... Basically something that leaves a big blank spot that says DM fill in here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My personal philosophy when I'm making characters is they all need to have either a goal or a problem. Yeah. And if they have a goal, you can kind of, you know, lock in a lot more of their backstory because they have something they're actively working towards. And that means that they're going to have something that they're driven to pursue. And if they have a problem, that's something that gets to be just kind of thrown at them whenever the DM finds it appropriate to throw it at them. Yeah. Um, Personally, I tend to like problems more, but both are valid schools of trying to give yourself some sort of plot hook to dawn. Yeah. To make it an interesting part of the campaign in the greater setting. Not necessarily all the time, you know, everything always works out depending on the table with TTRPGs. Um, but I find that that's kind of universally always yeah. nice to hand the DM on a silver platter like, hey, here's a way you can emotionally damage me. Yeah. I mean,. It's kind of just common courtesy to build into mm -hmm. your character a reason for them to engage with the plot. Um, yeah. Like, there's... I haven't seen this very recently, which I think is quite good, but for a while in D&D there was this sort of built-in adversarial feeling where it was, like, players versus the DM, and mm. that's not at all the case. Like... No. But in some games, in some older settings, in some older styles of play especially... It kind of was framed like that. It's like the DM has the whole world to play with and the characters have their characters and it's, you know, how long can they last before the DM kills them? Um, mm -hmm. And this adversarial format, uh, I think is part of why there was a certain amount of pushback to this newer style of D&D &D that's being popularized by actual play podcasts um, mm -hmm. where it's being it's more treated. Like story focused mm -hmm. and more about like 
more of a collaborative improv experiment, which sounds awful to say out loud as a 20-something-year-old. <laughs> collaborative <laughs> improv experiment. Yeah, man, it's really great. We got our boys, yeah. you know, Matt, Frank, Pat, Matt, and Matt. <laughs> um, new D&D campaign pitch. We all play as an improv troupe. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> there have to be at least three Matts, and they all need nicknames. Everyone is a bard. <laughs> You're not allowed uh-huh. to be anything but a bard. Well, everyone's got, like, one level of bard, but is something else. But yeah. they only try to use the bard skills, <laughs> you know? Oh, no. Um, I think this is a great idea, actually. I think this is something, anyway. Uh, but, you know, you, you get these these interesting s- scenarios where the players maybe feel like they're fighting the DM or the DM feels like they're sort of wrestling the players back on track, stuff like that. Um, but it's generally understood at this point that the DM and the players are working together to try and tell an interesting story. And from that Mm -hmm. mindset, it makes sense that you would build into your character a reason for them to participate in the plot. It it feels like just common politeness, you know, to... Yeah. uh, So... It's it's not universal. There are definitely some DMs and players who are more combative by nature. Um, Austin has mentioned previously in the podcast, but just like, he's in a home game uh, where they do like high level, extremely difficult combat and characters die constantly, but everyone at the table is on board for that. Everyone knew what they were getting into going in. I think the important thing to be at all times in TTRPGs is transparent about what you are there for. Um, And and the push away, as someone who prefers RP to combat, the push away from, you know, the more combative player DM relationships into collaborative storytelling has been great for me personally. Um, But I don't want to totally disparage the other methods of play even if they're not my personal favorite there's no, you mean, know definitely people out there who enjoy them well that's kind of the whole point of games like tomb of annihilation or you know call of cthulhu where yeah. it's very typical for player parties to have a 100 percent mortality rate but um mm-hmm. sort of looping back to the exu calamity thing it is interesting seeing players in a dm go into a story expecting those players to die um mm, it is a yeah. different mindset it's sort of like what sort you know you start a movie and there's like you know, ambient narration, like, this is the story of how I died, or, like, this is the day I died. You're probably or like wondering that. how I got there. <laughs> that tends to be a little more comedic, but this is kind of like, okay, this is a sad story, and the person you're following is not going to survive the movie, and you're like, okay, cool. Uh, it, it sort of gives you a, a chance to prepare, rather than just being blindsided, which is why, you know, a standard D&D combat that goes terribly wrong is a lot more stressful, because it's like, well, I didn't build this character to die. It won't be narratively satisfying if they die now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't have a chance to sort of prepare or build up. Uh, whereas if you're playing, you know, <laughs> Call of Cthulhu, you build yourself an intrepid adventurer and you figure out what it's going to look like when they die horribly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, like, gives you a chance to prepare and it gives the audience mm-hmm. foreknowledge in order to sort of, like... I'm kind of a weenie about this. Like, part of the reason why I refused to watch Game of Thrones while it was still going is because I was like, if the character dies, I don't want to get invested yet. Like, I want to know it's coming. Um, so my plan had just been to wait until it ended. And then, <laughs> well, we all know how that ended. But, like, you know, with something like Calamity, it's almost relaxing because I know everything is fucked. So, like, watching from the very beginning, I'm like, ah, yes, good. <laughs> this is going to be so cathartic when it ends terribly. Um but anyway, uh, with that in mind, like when you build a D&D character, you are probably expecting to play them for a while. You know, you give them an interesting backstory, you get a lot of plot hooks, DNPCs, you want to, s- sorry, that's not actually a D&D term. I think that's actually a champion's term too. It means dependent NPCs. So like if your character has like a Ma and Pa Kent or, you know, a Mary Jane or somebody at home who's yeah. just like an NPC who's connected to you, but otherwise has no gameplay purpose, DNPC. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you, you build all those things in because you want to take this character through a lot of interesting ways. And especially, I think, your first major D&D character you can be very attached to, which is completely fine. Like, that's just kind of normal, especially, like, the first time you do any form of art, I think it's okay yeah. to kind of be a little bit extremely, like, this has to be perfect. Um, oh, for sure. I think my first D&D character was, like, an edgy drow ranger. You know, of like, course. you just got to play, like, character and then yeah. you change from there and now i play usually by some yeah. reason also an officer yeah. on the only broadcasted dnd stream in a while. well it's fun and like rolling with difficulty like i've played dnd before but this was my first time playing 5e and my first time on an actual play podcast and i wanted to give myself mm-hmm. something that i thought would be fairly yeah. 
low energy and and low risk to play like a character who's who's not i mean you know she plays a structural role in the team but it's not like if you mess this up everybody dies <laughs> or like you have to hard carry or you know you, you must be the healer or you must be the tactician it's more like you know do what you can have a good time you know i didn't even give myself a particularly complicated character voice to do <laughs> i just really didn't want to mess up uh but now yeah. i'm not going to spoil anything about it but i've been uh sort of brainstorming the beginnings of a character for a different actual play podcast uh oh. and i've just been sort of fooling around with like maybe like a like a druid like like maybe Ooh. maybe she's like sort of still figuring a lot of stuff out but like maybe there's some like dark forces at work and she's she's trying to unravel the mystery you know like a a con yeah. like a constructing a full character in my head who is not just like a very easy like mask for me to put on and then work through but like what would this character do it might be different than what i would do so yeah. yeah, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of value in playing a self in character in some ways. Um, one of the home game characters I play is definitely just, like, me but more charismatic. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that character is fun to play because I don't have to think too hard about it. So it's a great for a game. Hmm. Um, but for Danny, I kind of knew. I was like, oh, I really want to do something that isn't... Um, that will let me have fun with the character, but I won't have to necessarily, like just play myself or think too hard about it at the same time because i knew i was gonna yeah. be doing all the behind the scenes stuff so i was like i need an easy kind of stock character that i can make fun through the way i play her um that was where we ended up with danny but you know yeah. there's, this is a very rambling way of saying there's a lot of there's no wrong way to play a D, &D character it's kind mm -hmm. of just like what will work for you and what will work for your table uh and just be re just be ready to give yourself some problems and try not to play like yeah the world's most perfect character unless you want them to get constantly dunked on by everyone else at the table um <laughs> we surreptitiously calling out a certain other foundational member of the of the channel with that one i've heard uh, some stories no, I, blue was also in the home game with um austin noir and i and his character is one of my favorites uh <laughs> when he played a paladin he's like the only really truly good character in the party yeah and unfortunately also very squishy so he dies a lot yeah he, he's <laughs> gleefully recounted the number of times he's gotten dunked on yeah. <laughs> um, but blue is enormous credit he has pl built that into the character in a way where when he does that it, there's a backstory related reason and he plays it in a really interesting way and he plays it off in a fun way there's yeah. been some good character interactions after his deaths and what have you um at this point i think almost every member of our party has died at some point uh to varying degrees of resurrection so mm. th this game had been running for like nearly two years oh um, yeah yeah it has been a hot minute. Uh, so. Yeah, and I think, yeah. well, uh, as an example of, like, a thing that you can watch that shows a player doing that, uh, I recommend uh, Dimension 20's Escape from the Blood Keep. I can't recommend yes. it highly enough. Yeah. Because We're, Matt, Matt Mercer, Mercer uh, yeah, <laughs> Matt Mercer plays uh, basically a thinly veiled reskinning of uh, the Witch King of Angmar, uh, the leader yeah. of the Ringwraiths. Uh and a series of phenomenally bad roles, <laughs> essentially just, he he's a very, they're all very powerful characters. Uh, mm -hmm. And he especially is like this incredibly powerful, like eldritch knight warlock type thing. He just keeps rolling incredibly badly. And the person he spends most of the game fighting is a halfling with the stats of a storm giant. And after he tries enough cool things and like they just fuck up, he like, to his credit, he rolls with it almost immediately. Uh, oh, yeah. That, like, he just kind of starts playing it as, like, this character feels like a fuck-up. He feels like he can't do anything right. He feels like the destruction of the crown and the, the fall of his master is all his fault. And just, like, all of this stuff is just reaffirming. I think there's one bit where, like, he fails a dex save and falls off a pirate ship and starts falling to his yeah. death. And instead of freaking out, yeah. he just says, of course. Um, <laughs> there's another bit where he, yeah. like, cho he, like, asks Brennan if he can use his reaction. And Brennan's like, yeah. And he just yells, fuck! <laughs> it's like a reaction is an important gameplay mechanic. <laughs> um, we, gotta, we gotta do it the fun way. Actually, this is sort of related, but I met uh, Ify Wadiwe at uh, VidCon very briefly. <gasps> and he was super sweet. Um, but we were, me and oh. Blue, uh, when I say, had to hide him after a panel, and we were talking a little bit about uh, Escape the Blood Keep because we were talking about his character. Right, and um, he's immeasurable. Yeah, it was. It was very, very sweet. And, yeah. uh he was talking about how much he enjoyed John Feathers' introduction. God, John Feathers. I, I mean, like, what a thing to for Brennan to improvise. What a Brennan is a, such a talented improviser. Yeah. 
<laughs> I truly the only valid improv. <laughs> what I gotta say though is like if people are interested in getting into D and D and are are like trying to figure out a play style or DMing style that works for them, I really can't encourage highly enough like seeing a diversity of play styles because yeah. as you watch through a lot of these, you will observe how a lot of these people react. So like Matt Mercer is really able to roll with the punches of like okay, this isn't going well, but that's okay. We can make this work. Uh, you know, we can have mm -hmm. fun. Uh, but he'll also kind of just, this is a character that lends himself very well to oscillating between like, this guy's a dork and this guy's really scary. So he kind of leads into that. Um, I personally cannot recommend Lou Wilson's play style enough. He's, uh, he's a regular on yeah. Dimension 20 and he's one of the players on EXU Calamity. And like, <laughs> Blue and I were actually talking about this the other day because the Dimension 20 player that a lot of people focus on is Emily Axford because Brendan Lee Mulligan has described her as endlessly talented, so fun to play with, and sent from hell personally to kill him. <laughs> um, yes. Emily Axford great. tries to break every game she is in and is frighteningly good at doing yeah. so. I don't know if you've listened to uh, Not Another D&D podcast at all, but she's also ah, a player there. And the I have not. is the DM. Uh, and she plays. Similar character, not a similar character, but like a similar type of play style. And it's just nice to see her against a different DM who's also a rules guy and watch that play out. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. What you're saying is 100% right of watching a variety of play styles, both in DM and players, to help you develop your own. Yeah. Um, because no, like not everyone is going to vibe with the Matt Mercer, like epic no. description, you know, epic what have you. Not everyone's going to vibe with the kind of like Brennan Lee Mulligan, yes and. 20 thing yeah which Brandley is Mulligan will like never tell a player no but sometimes yeah. you can tell a player no like it's okay um, mm -hmm. um not everyone's gonna vibe with Austin's very <laughs> atmospheric descriptions of the different areas of the planescape oh, go watch so uh, yes um, um but I sorry I wanted but, to uh, talk about yeah Lou Wilson's play style um because the thing that impresses me having seen him in Unsleeping City and the first season of Fantasy High and now EXU Calamity is that mm -hmm. he always understands the assignment. Like, yes. he can seem kind of <laughs> understated a lot of the time as things are going in a sort of chill way, but, like, it's just because he integrates so well into whatever he's doing. And he is kind of two for two at this point on flamboyant swashbucklers. <laughs> um, uh, his character in Unsleeping City, Kingston Brown, is kind of the uh, the exception, but honestly, I think the first time I was really impressed with his playstyle was seeing him as Kingston in Unsleeping City because Kingston's whole vibe is that he is like he, he's like the the cleric of new york city <laughs> um yeah he's so the, the vox populi the, the vox speaker populi. of the people yeah um and he he's kind he, of he doesn't quite play as foundational a role in the story of that season as uh ali does but mm -hmm. kingston is a very important foil to ali's character uh and one of the things that I just remember being so impressed with is that, like, the thing with Kingston is that everybody knows Kingston. He will just run into yeah. a million <laughs> NPCs, and it'll just be like, he'll just, like, react immediately. Like, oh, hey, someone will just be like, oh, Kingston Brown from town. He'll just be like, oh, how you doing? The golem of, you know, <laughs> Brooklyn or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and just immediately roll with it, and him and Brennan will just improvise out basically an entire backstory for this character and how Kingston knows them and how he helped them out one time, which is very impressive. Uh, and then I saw the way he played it in Calamity, where for the first, I want to say, three episodes, he's like, he's important, but he's kind of just filling a structural background role. He's like, he's doing stuff, he's mostly just doing what you expect him to do. Uh, while other characters are like, flirting with devils, or, you know, <laughs> doing <laughs> wizardly acts of hubris that threaten the integrity of reality itself. He's just like, no, boy, I sure weird. love gold and stuff. Um, <laughs> But he just really gets a chance to shine, like full Errol Flinning it up, full swashbuckler in the, in the final episode. And and you can just tell he's loving it. Uh, and that was the part where I was like, all right, Emily Axford is an incredible player. Lou Wilson always understands the assignment. Uh, yeah. And if you're watching both of those, like, Emily will try to break any game she's in. She will be like, I'm going to shapeshift into my mom and then I'm going to skip out on school. You can't railroad me into going to school, old man. <laughs> it's like, hey, this is a fantasy high. You have to go to school eventually. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it, it, that, I think that's important too if you're trying to learn how to DM because it's like you got players that will try to fight you, but in like kind of a, a fun way. Um, and Yeah, you can at me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know how often I say to Austin, I need some clarification on this before I take my action in combat. The number of times that saved us means I'm not going to complain about that ever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's. I think 
especially now when you're sort of getting into D&D by seeing other people play it, it's very easy to think, I need to emulate one of these styles. Yeah. But really what I think you learn from seeing more and more of this stuff is like everybody's play style and DMing style is unique and the way everybody interacts with every other player is also unique. There is no mm-hmm. one way to do it and there's no right way to do it. Uh, you really just got to find what you're comfortable with and what works for your DM and party. And that really yeah. does kind of have to be trial and error. <laughs> exactly. You can watch other players to get an idea of maybe some things that they do that you like that might inform decisions you make at your table, but Ultimately, your play style is your own. It's going to be unique from everyone else's yep. based on you as a person and the table you're playing at. Mm. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no easy way to get to what that style is other than playing the game. Yep. And if you can't play it as much as you like, watch other people play it and see what you like and what they do. Yeah. Um, and if you want to watch the campaign, check out Rolling with <laughs> check out Rolling with Difficulty, the D and D actual yeah. play podcast that we're on. Uh, episode one. Do went Danny's up- voice. What do you want me to say in Danny's voice, chat? Yeah. We can do Danny. Yeah, what do you want us to say in Danny's voice? <laughs> yeah, you know, we can really, you know, what, is, what are the words that we're like? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. just like pushing air through your throat. It's super easy. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's uh, uh, episode one went up on Friday. I think episode two goes up, what, this Friday? Like, it's it's yeah, going to be a we'll weekly thing? Yeah, we'll be releasing pretty much every Friday for the next, like, ten weeks or so. Perfect, yeah, um, so if, definitely if stay tuned for that. Um, um, um yeah. But season one is all up, including episode zero, which was our practice session. Yeah. Um, I recommend starting at episode one if you're going to go back to season one. Um, yes. Maybe just do zero a little later on when you know you want a little bit more because it's a little bit rough around the edges. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have some like postseason Q's and Q and A's and level ups and all that fun stuff. Um, but it's a blast. Yeah. I like so it so much. And if I'm you're so thirsty for D and D content, content, we have a bunch. Uh, so definitely check yes. that out. Uh, and yeah. also, personally, I say watch it on YouTube and leave comments because I love reading those comments and there aren't enough for my taste. So Yes, it is. Podcasting, unfortunately, I think I've realized with it as someone who produces a few shows now is that there's not a lot of good direct feedback loops in podcasting. You don't get a lot of immediate listener reactions. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it is nice to have the YouTube comment section. Uh, also, the otherly sarcastic channel on the OSP mm. Discord sometimes does a little discussion um you know yeah those are always fun so advertise rolling with difficulty in character (laughs) check it out you get to meet the worst family in the world (laughs) that's mine the planescape the 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 perasper crew is the best family (laughs) smacks perasper this bitch can fit so much trauma in it (laughs) (laughs) especially after that one thing and well we'll get there don't worry anybody it's fine (laughs) Oh, um, man. Yeah, this is last. Oh, do we have any more D and D in our system? Or have we oh, I've got. I mean, I've got D and D for days. I've got. I, I got into D and D when I was nine. <laughs> oh yeah, I've I been in this fight since I was six years old. <laughs> I think I've been playing since high school with just like different tables, and now mm. I now I pretty much only play with the one table that is split across a couple different campaigns, and it's it's rough because I don't get to whip out all my new characters as much. I, I I'm all these shiny characters table. saved up. <laughs> I, I love our table. Yeah. I think it's a great... It's one of my favorite tables I've ever played with, genuinely. Yeah. Um, I've been... I do want to play more characters. <laughs> I, <laughs> so I many feel like go. it could be interesting to sort of try doing more, like, little one-shots or something like that. I mean, I've yeah. been sort of, like, circling the drain on trying to DM something because I've never DM'd. Ooh. It's terrifying. Ooh. I don't know if I can do it. I'd probably be bad at it, but I think it would be, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guaranteed to be bad at it the first time I try, but it's scary and I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, yeah. I've been trying to learn the rule sets for Call of Cthulhu for no particular reason uh-huh. um, to run that, and it's been a fun time, but I think I'm going to be better at it than I am at D&D because there's numbers involved. Yeah. <laughs> the numbers are usually what gets me when I'm DMing because yeah. I'm not great at stats and things. Um, so the idea of just atmospheric horror is my vibe. I've been sort of, here's the thing, like, I think my dream for this, my, you know, my years in advance thing is I've been wanting to DM and I've been wanting to get more people into Exalted. Mm. And if I could find a way to make Exalted one shot friendly, oh, it would be perfect. (laughs) But man, that's a dense, poorly designed system, (laughs) but it would be so fun. I don't know. I th- that's that's the ideal, but I really don't want to mess it up. <laughs> so it's scary. 
play a home game. You can mess it up and no one will care because your friends are just there to have a good time, baby. Yeah. That's, the, that's the party. Um, if you ever do that, though, and you need players, hit me up. Oh, I mean, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll just ping the, uh, the role in the difficulty chat and be I like, exalted yeah. so much. And I'm like, I want to try the system out, but no one else I know plays it. So like, I uh, think it would be very fun. Uh, like, what I might... would like us to do a magical girl exalted, and I would like to second. Oh, yeah, we could absolutely <laughs> play a sidereal campaign. You guys are basically just going to be the Sailor Scouts. Um... Uh, yes. Although the thing is, like, here's here's the secret. Like, the Sidereals are the ones that look like the magical girls, but everyone is a different kind of magical girl. Like, the Solars are oh, like yeah. classic shonen heroes. You get super strength and like Kamehameha blasts and giant robots and and magic swords and shit. And then if you're a Lunar, you get to be a furry. And then if you're a Sidereal, <laughs> you get to be a group a, a group of magical girls, uh, which is is great fun. It's Super fun. Um, so I, I think I think the move. He wants to do this. Like, obviously, the. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a good idea. In fact, I might just pop into the Rolling with Difficulty Discord and be like, "Hey guys, if you were gonna make an exalted character, like, what would the vibes be? <laughs> you know, that might be yeah. the motivation I need to actually figure out how to make this happen. Oh, yeah, if I know, um, but. I think one of my favorite pastimes is just streaming up characters. I usually use D&D &D 5e when I'm thinking of characters just as like a framing for the system because yeah. it's the one I'm the most familiar with. But I've played a few other um, TTRPGs in the past. And I think look, character creation is always... Much like in RPG video games, character creation is usually a screen I spend far too much time on. So. Yeah. <laughs> I once spent like three days straight homebrewing up a warlock patron Sun Wukong situation. Nice. Uh, nice. trying really hard not to make it crazy OP and failing. Uh, well, as soon as I decided, like, the first thing you get is true sight, I was like, oh, this is gonna be busted. <laughs> <laughs> but it made sense. That's his whole deal. Anyway, yeah. uh, that's, that's what makes oh. me think I might actually enjoy DMing because I genuinely really do love world building. The hard part mm. is figuring out what story to tell in it. And when you do D&D, &D, like, that's the player's job, baby. <laughs> you just sprinkle yeah. stuff in the world and turn them loose. So, like, I feel like I could get good at this, but first I'd have to suck at it. And we're so public that I'd probably suck at it in front of people. It's scary. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> nah. Uh, yeah. Not to make the chat angry, but we could always just play a game, just a uh, home game. <laughs> <laughs> have to be proud. That could be fun. Huh. I, I, when it's yeah. less plaguey, I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, what type of hat would Danny and Kiana want to wear? Uh, goggles no hat <laughs> hair must be free <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes i do like that danny and kiana have slowly procured like closer and closer to the same hairstyle as the seasons have gone on <laughs> well it's just like in season one you were full ponytail and i was like half up half down yeah now you're half up half down and i'm like also a little a little more down a little less up but still in the same region we're, we're getting closer and closer oh i can't help <laughs> it that wally's character designs are so dang good <laughs> I know. Uh, every time I got the art, it was like yeah. a little gift. <laughs> I was like, oh, my hair would be longer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just super fun. Um, oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Ooh. Chet's just gushing about games now, which is great. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I don't know. D&D &D is very fun. I'm very glad it's becoming more of like a well-known and not just D&D &D, of course just the general space of TTRPGs is a lot of fun mm -hmm. um it's been very surreal watching this go from like a like a niche nerdy thing to just yeah. like a thing that like <laughs> squads of beautiful been, people do it's online crazy yeah I'm like why does this be like this one of the nerdiest things I did in high school and now it's like just every <laughs> Every even slightly alt friend group is probably <laughs> on a D and D game going, and that's great. It is, yeah. Up, up. I think that it, it's the more people I get to play with, so it's a win win in my book. <laughs> I also think it's rapidly accelerated the just the space of like game development and uh, the evolution of D and D as a game system, uh, because with this many people playing it, you are getting so and playing it publicly, you are getting just so much more information about different people's play styles. People are learning yeah. a lot without ever having to actually play before they even start playing. They learn a lot of like. The etiquette, the do's and don'ts, um, which is just very cool. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's a blast. Uh, um, sorry, person in chat asked, uh, favorite Dimension 20 season? Ooh. Um, Escape from the Bloodkeep is up there, but I think my ooh. favorites are probably the Unsleeping City. 
yeah. campaigns. Like, especially since I live in New York now, it's fun to <laughs> just be like, "Hey, I remember that from the Unsleeping City." Oh man, <laughs> yeah, the Unsleeping City, uh, season one. Excuse me, it's definitely so my favorite. Pretty. I haven't watched through season two yet, and Bloodkeep is great, but Bloodkeep is also a one shot, so I'm not sure it counts. Oh my god, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Bloodkeep's great. They're kind of one shot. Um, I mean, like, all, all of them are great. I haven't watched the newest, uh, or what was it, um, the space one. Yeah, I've seen stuff uh, from Star, it, though. Star I've seen clips from it. It looks great. I'll get to it eventually. I just have so deep in the rolling with the I don't have any <laughs> mind space to watch any other actual play. Yeah, I mean, that's um, completely reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, Fantasy High is a classic. Always great. Not a terrible starting place. Um, yeah. I, I like Crown of Candy a lot. It made me very sad and very happy all at once. You, you remember um, how I was like, if I don't know a character's going to die before the show, like before the series starts, I don't want to watch it? That's why I haven't watched any Crown of Candy. <laughs> I have much higher tolerance for that. Uh, yeah. So I get so I attached. I did watch Game of Thrones when it was airing. Ooh. I actually watched all of Game of Thrones. Um, so I thought that second to last season was the last season, and I wanted to catch up. Ah. so i watched six seasons in two weeks um i don't recommend it bad way to watch the show <laughs> but also kind of a great way to watch the show yeah in <laughs> hindsight emotional whiplash in hindsight i got through a lot of emotional labor <laughs> in the span of two weeks um and then i learned that there was still a whole other season that i had caught up for nothing Oof. um uh, i actually watched the last season of game of it was in shanghai and that was experience because there was one particular bar that at like two in the morning would air the episodes oh um, incredible and they would just like have it jam packed with all of the other <laughs> foreigners stuck in there um and the mood in that bar got worse and worse every week wow <laughs> and watching it was like watching a like a death in slow motion it was <laughs> incredible um made the whole experience 10 times better <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, at least it's pain shared. Sorry, the person yeah. uh, asking my favorite impending apocalypse menacing all of creation and exalted. Oh, so mm. many possibilities, but like, it's basic, but I'm a real big fan of the Ebon Dragons whole deal. Like, just the worst and, and the whole stuff with the Scarlet Empress. Just what a shit show. Uh, everything else is kind of like a slow build up to that apocalypse anyway. So like, it's completely fair. It makes yeah. sense. Um, but I also, I like the wild chewing on the edges of creation because it's just it, it's just such a good world building excuse to put all the hot random bullshit okay. out there that you want to put in there um the world of exalted is a straight up mess like if you aren't say, exalted it like they've got a lot of problems <laughs> the world of exalted was originally pitched as a distant prequel to the world of darkness like vampire the masquerade werewolf the apocalypse oh, yeah. mage the ascension uh which is a real hot mess of a setting Uh, aside from its many internal contradictions between game systems where you literally can't really cross them over because they just don't work the same uh the world (laughs) of darkness setting is kind of known for having no upward mobility like in a DD game as your character goes up levels you sort of expect to become more ridiculous and more like more godlike and powerful world of darkness doesn't really do that like especially the vampire the masquerade it's just a full multi-level marketing thing like you can never go up levels there it's jam-packed full of people who are always going to be tougher than you and they don't die of old age so like what are you going to do um exalted was originally pitched as a very distant prequel to that but they scrapped that pretty early in development so instead it's just this completely different like ridiculously high power fantasy world uh that's like a thin weave of creation surrounded on all sides by the chaos of the wild which is kind of the same vibe they have in warhammer 40k where it's like order is like a thin scum on the surface of chaos which is an infinite roiling mass and so you've got all this like fairy shit and just chaos stuff on the edges of creation chewing its way and trying to unravel it um you got a lot of stuff going on there's a the, the the inciting incident at the beginning of the setting of Exalted is uh, that a thing called the Jade Prison is broken, and all these exaltations that were imprisoned in it are released. And exaltations are basically a soul that comes with superpowers. And when they attach to a, a mortal that they fit, they give that person a growing power set that sort of adapts and evolves with them, an increasingly, like, a ridiculously long lifespan, and some fragmented memories from the previous people that their exaltation was attached to. Uh, so the Jade Prison was storing 
uh, all the Solar Exaltations after they were all straight up assassinated. <laughs> they were Ides of March uh, at, a, at an event called the Usurpation orchestrated by the Sidereal Exalted, which were empowered by the five maidens that are associated with the planets. That's where you get the Sailor Scout stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And basically they observed that all these Solar Exalted that had lived for centuries seemed to all be going very slowly bad. <laughs> Uh, like, they were all sort of getting really into hedonism and hubris and, like, really disconnecting from humanity and, and just, you know, it was just bad. So they were like, we gotta get rid of these guys. So they killed all of them and they trapped their exaltations in this jade prison. And then the jade prison gets broken and half the solar exaltations get nabbed by these, like, gods of evil and turned into abyssal exaltations, which are like the, the solar ones, but evil and goth. So that's how you get your vampire alikes. The, really, this is good for all the World of Darkness players. If you want to play a vampire, you can be an abyssal. If you want to play a werewolf, you can be a lunar. If you want to be a decent human being, you can play a solar, but not for long. Uh, and if you want to be <laughs> hilariously underleveled, you can be a terrestrial exalted, the dragon-blooded, that are basically like Avatar The Last Airbender-style benders, uh... But you're so hilariously underleveled compared to everybody else running around that you're kind of fucked. They've basically been running the world while all the solars were away, but now all these baby solars are running around already stronger than them, fighting armies. Everyone is screwed, basically. Um, the uh, the secret component of the world building that the solars and lunars are not aware of, or the siderials, is that all of these celestial exalted are su subject to a thing called the Great Curse that fucks them up progressively as they age. So all the solars started going crazy because they'd lived for so long that the Great Curse was taking all their virtues and turning them into flaws. This is a game mechanic. I'm not just being poetic. Uh, <laughs> there, You have different virtues with points allocated, and whichever one is the highest is, like, your main virtue, and that's the one that the Great Curse afflicts. So, like, you can have an incredibly high compassion stat, and your Great Curse might be that you become so compassionate that you can barely function. Like, you care so much about all the pain in the world. Oh, no! Uh, or it can completely flip and you just become this, like, unfeeling sadist. Uh, so Ooh. having these guys running the world was pretty bad, but the thing is the Siderials noticed this, but they didn't think they were subject to the Great Curse because, as I recall, their Great Curse thing is hubris. So they're just like, only we can see the true, <laughs> the true way forward. We gotta get rid of these guys. Uh, so everything is going to shit all the time, but it's much higher power level than Vampire the Masquerade, and you can... You can have things going to shit while you're in, like, a giant robot or, like, <laughs> fighting your soulmate <laughs> or, like, the evil vampirized version of your former bestie or lover or something like that. So there's oh, all God, kinds yeah. of fun drama. Uh, drama. 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 <laughs> also, <laughs> lunars get cool night. glowing tattoos all over their body. I forgot that part. Oh, uh, always important. Yes. Love a good glowing tattoo. Um, yeah. I have written a few extra NPCs for the heap in Rolling with Difficulty. <laughs> One of them does have glowing tattoos. I will not say anything more about it at this time. Uh, but I'm very excited. <laughs> um. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, so freaking good. Yeah, uh, I love TTRPGs, which is unfortunate because I hate board games. I really don't <laughs> like them. I find them really boring. There's too many rules and I'm terrible at learning them on the fly and I think it makes Blue really sad. It's the ADHD, like, buddy. I got the exact same it way. Is. Oh. I just, as soon as someone starts reading me instructions, I'm like, I I just gotta play and figure yeah. it out. But a board game is never long enough for me to play and figure it out. Or it's so complicated and so long that I lose interest too quickly. I will um, say that uh, I've got... Uh, I've also got a couple friends. I mean, Blue is one of them, but I've got a couple other friends who are crazy into D, uh, t, uh, like board games, and uh, they've mm -hmm. sort of cottoned on to the fact that like if they read me the the words, I'll try, bless my heart, but it won't work. Yeah. Uh, but they'll be like, "Do you want to just play a quick round, or like you know, go through the motions and then start the game for real?" Uh, and I've had some luck that way. So it it really yeah. does kind of matter who you're playing with because you know some people they can sit down and get the rules all and go, but sometimes you just gotta go through like a test round. Uh, yeah, I feel so. like the problem I run into sometimes is that I, if I'm hanging out with all my friends, I want to be talking to my friends, and sometimes a board game sort of stops a conversation dead in its tracks. Yeah. Sometimes you can talk over them, sometimes you really can't. Um, yeah. And TTRPGs are basically just have a conversation, but with some dice rolling occasionally. It does depend. Sometimes the TTRPGs, you, you kind of got to stay on track because, oh, I will yeah. go off on tangents so quickly. Um, yeah, there's... You know, Noir and I talking about Lion King one and a half it was nothing in Home Alone in episode what yeah. four. That's <laughs> maybe not on topic, but it was fun. <laughs> that was so fun. Uh, that was one of my favorite moments of this first season. <laughs> yeah. 
that happens a lot when you get Noir and I in the same conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's ideal. Uh, yeah. And it can also be fun when the RP kind of runs away from you. But uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's it. that's actually something that I found interesting in the sort of the newer wave of TTRPG players is there's a lot more focus on, like, individual RP where the rest of the players don't necessarily have anything to do. Um, yeah. And there was a time where that was, like, a faux pas. Uh, like if you were the player that was causing that, it was like, dude, come on. Uh, and, like, if the DM was, like, fully focusing on, on another character and nobody else could really play, it's like, what do you even do? Uh, but, mm-hmm. I'm honestly, that's a lot of that is a matter of what table you're with because yeah, I think it is, frankly, just good manners to be able to be like, oh, this isn't about me? That's okay. I'll refill my <laughs> snacks or something. Um, or I'll just revel in the drama. Like, I yeah. don't have to worry about the stakes and I can just watch someone else play out this fun moment it's this is this is free this is free entertainment yeah exactly um um but oh man i i don't want to get too spicy uh but there's an interesting (laughs) object lesson if you watch through the very beginning of the first campaign of critical role um yeah because there's a player there for the first 20 something episodes who is not part of any later things um and if you listen through those episodes you can infer some some of the reasons why that is. Uh, not, mm-hmm. I mean, like, I, I don't advocate for, like, conspiracy theorism or, like, getting too far into other people's personal affairs. That's not what I'm trying to do here. It's just there are things about the play style of this, this player versus the others where you're like, okay, some gears are grinding here. The, these aren't quite meshing. Like, they're working on different... Mm-hmm. They're working on different internal rules of how players work, basically. Um and it's there's a lot there uh my observation when i was first listening through it is that this player seemed to feel most comfortable treating his character as the main character of the campaign uh Mm -hmm. when matt mercer would put focus on other players and their pcs and their character backstories this player would often try to sort of intrude with like Oh, I believe we could solve this with the my backstory, where I have the, this entire army at my command, and they're like, mm, "No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to do the actual Briarwood arc, bud." Um, and that's just sort of a general faux pas as a player, uh, where if another character is having like an intense solo arc, like you kind of got to accept that you are now a supporting character in that arc. That's fine. Yeah. It can be great fun to be a supporting character. You can do all kinds of cool mm-hmm. stuff. It's much less stressful. You're not carrying the story. <laughs> you can just react to stuff. But this is another thing that a lot of people do, especially early when they're playing, uh, is they put a lot of their ego in the player in the character. And we were talking earlier about like mm. needing to be able to roll with your own failures and stuff like that. Uh, that's really tricky if you are too emotionally invested in your character looking a certain way like Mm -hmm. if you need to look cool and then you roll in that one like you're gonna want to fight the dm about it rather than yes anding it you know you you sort of need to build a character that can accept failure or at least function with it uh Mm -hmm. and this can be tricky, you know, especially in a thing where it's like you need to make a character and then you need to be that character. It's like, oh, I'm going to make a cool character who is somebody I want to be. And then it's like, oh, this character you want to be, they just messed up bad. And you're like, no. So it, it's it's a completely reasonable thing to freak out about. But it's something that you kind of need to exposure therapy yourself out of so you can have any fun playing any of these characters. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the, the life advice that translates both to the real world and to D&D has always been, for me, don't take yourself too seriously. Mm. Um, you know, you can, you could, you're going to have your cool moments. That's the way that the numbers game works. Yeah. Um, but it means you're also going to sometimes have some where you absolutely shit and you got to just be okay with that. Yeah. You can still have fun playing your character. Maybe your character is like really down on themselves for having you know failed at a critical moment or something and you can play that out in an interesting way but (laughs) you know you can't make it um a worse experience for the other players in the dm in the real world you can't let the story and the emotions that you're trying to play out spill over into bringing down the the enjoyment of everyone who you're playing with because at the end of the day it is a game that you're playing and it's a collaborative game yeah and so you have to make sure that it's not just serving you it's serving the whole table yeah, I think that's an important thing to to focus on. Like, there are sort of two schools of thought about what is the point of playing a game, and one of those is mm-hmm. the point is to win, and the other one is the point is to have fun. 
It's a game. Yeah. If you're not having fun, why are you playing it? Um, and of course, in something like D&D, winning is so subjective and, and difficult that I think mm-hmm. a lot of people kind of get easily hung up on that. But the fact is, you know, you're winning as long as you're having a good time. And you can have a good yeah. time when your characters are distinctly not. Um, mm-hmm. So all that to say, I think it's it's pretty important to sort of desensitize yourself to the idea of like, your character is not always going to be the focus. Your character is not always going to win. And your character is not always mm-hmm. going to look cool. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this can be tricky. And a lot of people have trouble with it. And more than that, like this is a play style that works for some tables. But you kind of need to figure out what works for the table you're at. Like, yeah, not everybody's going to be super into like, hey, let's have a really quick improvised deep in character conversation about your backstory. Like some people love that stuff. Personally, I find it a little bit stressful. I always worry I'm going to mess it up. Uh, even though it's improv, there's there's no way to mess up. Yes. Um, but, you know, some people really like drawing a hard line between themselves and their character. Uh, Indigo, I know you've talked about, like, part of the reason you do character voices is to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that helps. Um, I love doing character voices. One <laughs> of the characters that is the most of myself, but just a person in a home game that I actually struggle playing a lot is the one character I don't do a voice for. Mm. Um I yeah. have a number of character voices that I do, and they're, Danny's probably the most ridiculous, but yes. there's been some questionable ones in there. And the fun of a home game is if you're doing a character voice, it doesn't have to be that good. Your no. friends are probably going to make fun of you a little bit if your Scottish Scottish accent is not perfect, but look it over it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's There's a reason that Danny is a voice and not an accent uh, <laughs> yeah. in the um, one campaign we're broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. And this is something I've been kind of thinking of, you know, experimenting more with, like I mentioned with this other character mm-hmm. I've been thinking about. Like, okay, yeah. if I if I... Rather than constructing this as something I'm embodying, but instead as, like, if I make this, like, a little separate person in my head and then let her do what she wants, like, what, what is that going to look yeah. like? And the thing is, I have more experience doing that than I do with RP because I write, I was you know? I that's, like, right, you, you, your comic Aurora, that's yeah. basically what the process of writing your character is. No, very much so. In fact, it's a process I am not to... This is not tooting my horn. This is an objective statement. I'm very good at writing characters, uh... Like, I, I'm, I'm very good at thinking through their dynamics and what they do. And periodically when I'm storyboarding them, they will surprise me because I'll realize in the moment, like, oh, this is exactly what this character would do. That feels like a very valuable skill set that can be transferred into D&D. But there's enough, like, just sort of anxiety mm-hmm. and stage fright baked into, like, but this isn't just a character. This is me as a character that, that mm-hmm. makes the whole process rather more fraught. So I'm, I'm sort of hoping that if I attack it from this different angle... I might have a different experience. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. At 100%. Every pl- character I've played and every table I've played at has been a type of experience in yeah. some way. Um, I personally love going the change the voice route. I just feel like it could connect to my brain to like get that level of separation I need to not get too hung up on the character itself. Mm. Uh, or or the, my personality in the character so much as the character is it, its own thing. That sentence got so far away from me <laughs> so quickly. Um <laughs> But I, I find the voice is incredibly helpful, but that's not the only strategy, you know? Like you got to find what works for you when you're building your characters and just how... And the percentage of yourself that you pour into the little mixing pot that is your character can change with every game and can change um, with every session. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You just got to experiment and figure out what works. Um, yeah. One of my favorite characters I've ever played uh, is just... It's not me at all, but has all of my academic anxiety. Uh, mm. <laughs> This is my uh, half orc warlock, um, the dumb lizard. I love her so much. She's so fun to play. Uh, yeah. Also, a campaign DM'd by Austin um, with Noir in it and a few other friends of ours. Perfect. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that every solid character anyone creates has a piece of them in it. Uh, yeah. I I have a long Tumblr post somewhere on my blog about uh, the difference <laughs> between a self insert character and a character with a piece of you in it. Um, yeah. Because the difference is a character with a piece of you in it has a piece of how you think, and a self-insert character is a character designed based on how you think you are. And those are two mm-hmm. extremely different things. Um, but, like, you know, you, you can take a character and put all kinds of parts of yourself in it that maybe you don't even realize until after the fact are mm-hmm. experiences that are kind of deep to you. Um, I, uh, I semi-recently realized that I have a great affection for creating characters that look human but aren't. Uh, mm. and speaking as, you know, <laughs> a, uh, a, an undiagnosed neurodivergent ace who didn't figure it out for nearly two decades, I've had a lot mm. of experience looking like one thing on the surface and feeling very different underneath. So exploring that through a lot of different characters, it's a lot of fun. Um, I explicitly put 
uh, I did this as a method of uh, just sort of mental processing some stuff. Uh, I had a I had a really rough patch in college at one point, and I just like took the rejection sensitive dysphoria out of my head and I put it in a character. And I was like, how would I deal with this if it wasn't in me? And I was like, oh, this is way more easy. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a lot of characters, you know, you you just oh, this character is going to have like my my sense of justice. This character is going to have my compassion or lack thereof this character Mm -hmm. is going to struggle with anger this character is going to be running from their past you know all kinds of things that you can pull from yourself and and put into a new context without Mm -hmm. losing what makes them work for you and you know with D &D, i think (laughs) i think a lot of times people don't do that on purpose like they'll be like i'm gonna make a joke character you know (laughs) sam regal makes joke characters all the time and they always end up being something heartbreaking one of my all-time favorite players so good at the like (laughs) third act gut punch i can't wait to see what fresh cut grass is dealing i feel (laughs) like used it (laughs) i think the first time he did it accidentally like scanlan was definitely a joke character and then he was like hey you know what we could explore my tragic backstory (laughs) and how it uh, (laughs) created this character that I am now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then then with every character since then, it's like this character is going to look like a goofball and then they're going to rip your heart out, which is just, and I love what he's doing in EXU Calamity too. Uh, Uh Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah. Loquacious (laughs) Seely. Quay to his love dynamics at any table is bickering divorces. I love I, their dynamic. I strive for it at every table. I have. I try to convince someone to play that with me, and I haven't had any success so far. The minute that Sam and Abria start just sort of bouncing off each other is the minute the entire rest of the table and Brennan goes dead silent and just watches. It's so. It's so, it's good. so good. It's astoundingly good. Like they are exactly on the right same page. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of that is because Abria is also a DM, uh, so she's really yeah. good at like sort of taking whatever energy the PCs are giving her and directing it back. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's just really impressive and good. Uh, <laughs> and but that's also like that's a thing that you know not every player has to do or be good at or comfortable with. Yeah. Like yeah. Any <laughs> in any party having two players that are in a like where their characters are in a romantic relationship is the kind of thing you probably want to talk through first. Um, yeah, that kind of gets into the making sure that everyone at the table is comfortable. Uh, the lines and veils is a system that a lot of DMs employ. Yep. Like saying, here's topics that players can anonymously say, like, I'm comfortable, I'm uncomfortable talking about this, or please don't mention this at all, etc. Yeah. And any sort of, like, that would be something that might happen in a session zero if you weren't recording a podcast. <laughs> um, getting that kind of... Uh, you know, making sure everyone's on the same page, making sure everyone knows, like, here are some lines we don't cross, here are um, some things I'm just uncomfortable with at a table is very important because the comfort of the other players and of you always comes before yeah. wanting to do a bit, you know? Uh, and as much as PC romances can be very fun, I've played some fun ones at tables in the past, you have to make sure that everyone involved in that is on board or else it gets very awkward and uncomfortable very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I got to say, I really approve of this Lines and Veils thing because in my experience playing D&D and such before this, that was not a generally, like, applied thing. There was no malice in yeah. it. It was just, like, not a thing that people considered. It was just, like, you kind of did it or, you you know, you, you, you took whatever happened or you, you didn't, um, mm-hmm. which led to some dubious experiences at conventions with tables I wasn't familiar with, <laughs> uh, which uh, we won't go into here, but... Broadly, mm-hmm. I'm very happy that we now have just this general understanding of like, hey, as with many things, D and D has a need for consent, <laughs> informed yeah. and enthusiastic at all times. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's a complicated space, especially you know, D and D is. <sighs> I feel like most people don't think of improv as an emotionally fraught or dramatic art form. It's generally framed in a comedy context, but D and D is essentially dramatic theatrical improv, and yeah. that means you can get to some pretty fucking weird places. And the thing is, that's interesting to me about this is this is not a space of the internet I ever dealt with, but I know that like online role play communities are like a thing. Like they just do like text role play and stuff like that, um, and that feels like it. Mm-hmm. It almost overlaps with what this this space of TTRPG gaming is now, where it's like. You just get two people, you get in character, and then you start doing stuff. You know, you start talking. You start playing out these complex, dark scenarios. Uh, 
it's the same like muscle as improv, but it's a very different feeling. Um, mm-hmm. I guess it's all just an extension of like you're on the playground and you're playing Star Wars, you know. Uh, it's fun <laughs> yeah. because you're you're experiencing, you're putting yourself in the head of a character in a situation that you are not in and probably wouldn't want to experience if it was really you, you know. Mm-hmm. There's a joy and catharsis in playing out something happening to a character that you would never want to experience yourself. Uh. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great. Thing. I don't really have too much to add. I think you're really the <laughs> middle head on that one. Yay! Yeah, acting. Yeah. Acting. I'm not an actor, but I do enjoy a good D and D moment every now. <laughs> um, yeah. It makes me think maybe I should have done more acting in my youth, not just tech. But that's that's not true. I really enjoyed tech theater. Uh, tech is to fun. An almost embarrassing degree. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to do more acting, but fortunately, D and D is yeah. now an inroad to acting. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we. <we're laughs> We are actors available to act. <laughs> <laughs> My IMDb resume uh, is D and D D and D. Is it? Wait, do you seriously have an IMDb page? I didn't make it myself, but someone did make an IMDb for various uh, OSP things. I don't know why. Uh, they list like every episode of Trope Talk as though it were an episode of a series. I didn't know there was. Are you googling it right now? <laughs> I'm googling it right now. I think you got suspiciously quiet. (laughs) (laughs) OSP. It would be under like OSP Red. It'd be overly sarcastic productions, and then it would be like actor Red, and it's like, well, I mean, I'm not gonna complain, but I don't know who did this. (laughs) Overly sarcastic productions, U.S. production. Yeah, so that's fun. Oh wow! Yeah, it's all summer. (laughs) It's really like it's surprisingly like (laughs) thought through. I don't know, man. Red is a writer and actress known for miscellaneous myths, <laughs> modern classic summarized, and trope talks. Truly one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about me. <laughs> <laughs> writer and actress, really? <laughs> so. Ooh. Schwanky. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Well, that's a fun fact. I did not know that about the uh, OSP extended universe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's to do about that? <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, but yeah, I mean... You know, D&D is such a complicated art form because it's so communal and it requires a level of, like, trust and interpersonal dynamics that basically no other form of art really quite matches. Like, theater, everyone's Mm -hmm. working on a script. Improv comedy, everyone's making jokes. Like, there's still, you know, lines and veils there, but, you know. um, And, uh... Comedy's never been problematic. (laughs) (laughs) Woof! Uh, it's just been, I don't know, I grew up in the space of, like, people who'd been in D&D since it was invented. So it's been very interesting for me watching over the last, you know, 10 years how it's changed uh, mm-hmm. and how it how the technology has so rapidly evolved now that so many more people oh, are yeah. involved in it. And just, like, these odd little pockets of people, like, most of the people I know who are into D&D are just thrilled that it's becoming this widespread, like, high budget thing you know uh Mm -hmm. fancy performances by you know beautiful actors and stuff like that and and we're getting fully animated we're getting non-garbage D &D media (laughs) for the first time (laughs) ever uh which is very impressive but it's just it's so interesting um and i'm excited to see where it goes and i am excited to get better at it because oh man (laughs) My uh my parents' home games uh were the what I grew up around and it it was a different style of play than anything that anyone's doing now. Uh it wasn't really RP heavy, it was like mystery box kind of. You know, you'd be in a setting mm-hmm. and there'd be problems and you'd need to find ways to yeah. solve them. Uh which meant I created a lot of characters with like fun backstories and like character quirks and I, I didn't really get a chance to like flex them just because it wasn't that sort of table and that's why i say like it's very important to sort of you know make a character that works with the table you're at and find a table that works with the play style that you favor um Mm -hmm. because there this is a very very flexible form of entertainment with a lot of factors in it uh and even like even one player at the table that's not into it can sort of change the whole tone uh yeah so it's a very 
it's a very experimental process, and you need to give yourself time to mess up. Like, I, I realize I was just like, I want a DM, but I need to get it perfect on the first try, or I'm terrible. And now I'm being like, no, it's very important that, you know, you give yourself time to get messy and, and have a good time. But, you know, you know how I do. So. Mm -hmm. And to your credit, you are already a very fun player to have at the table. Um, I've very much enjoyed having you on Rolling with Difficulty. Thanks. And just, like, in general. I, you and I are friends. I was like, I'm pretty sure that'll be a good time. But, like, you've been, I really, really, like, played Kiana, play off the characters at the table and like your style. So thanks. I try really hard. <laughs> it works. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. Oh, D and D and other TTRPGs. D &D so much beyond. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, we've been on this for nearly three and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> remember when we were playing trivia? <laughs> I do. It was good stuff. We, we should probably wind this down. I'd say in the next seven minutes, make it a nice yeah. even. Do you want to do one hours? last round of trivia to like bring it home? Yeah, why not? To really lampshade it. Hold on, let me pull up the nerdy trivia Yay. questions again. Um, okay, we need a category. Hold on. It's okay. loading. It's loading. We have Star Trek the Original Series, Captain Marvel, 1980s video games, Lord of the Rings, Quotable Ooh. Whedonverse, Classic Board Ooh. Game, Game of Thrones, Looney Tunes, Marvel's The Avengers, Star Wars, A New Hope, 1950s sci-fi movies, Jaws, Mathematics We Already Did, yep. Disney Renaissance, Biology, Godzilla, Shakespeare We Already Did, The X-Men, The Science of Physics, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Pixar Studios, Canada History and Geography, which I think is probably <laughs> Spider-Man, so the French... French Revolution, Astronomy, we already did, Fine Arts, The X-Files, Legend of Zelda, we did, yep. Same Name, Star Trek, The Next Generation, Done and Dusted, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, <laughs> Children's Literature, Scooby-Doo, Pirates and Maritime History, Science Fiction Television, Quotable 1980s, Trivia, Been There, Done That, DC Comics, Villains, Movie Monster, Back to the Future Trilogy, Ghostbusters, World War One, The Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide to the Galaxy, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Food and Cooking Around the World, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, C Christmas Traditions Around the World, <laughs> Quotable Christmas Movie Trivia, Free Christmas Carol, Classic Doctor Who Trivia, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Classic Battlestar Galactica Trivia, Card Game Trivia, The Life and Works of Edgar Allan Poe Trivia, Women in Comics Trivia, Star Trek Voyager Trivia, The Academy Awards Trivia, One Year Anniversary Trivia Special, no idea what that topic's supposed <laughs> to be about, Final Fantasy Trivia, Geometry Trivia, which we've done, no wait, we did other math, yeah. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix Trivia, Women in STEM Trivia, 1960s Movie Trivia, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel Trivia, Money and Currency Trivia, and then there's more, but I'm not going to go to the next right. page. Yeah, yeah. I think we should either do Lord of the Rings or that quotable Whedonverse thing, and I guess the only question is, do we want to talk about a story we like, or do we want to dunk on Joss Whedon tonight? Mm, both so tempting all the time. Well, I did recently we three seasons of Buffy, <laughs> but I do like the Lord of the Rings quite a bit, although I feel like I'm going to be very bad at it. <laughs> well, we could always do both. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which one do you want to do first? They're right oh, next God. to each other. Uh, all right. Uh, heads is going to be Lord of the Rings. Tails is going to be Whedonverse. Hey, Siri, flip a coin. Just a sec. Have I considered being an auctioneer chat? It's heads. Uh, no. I'm too bad with math to read out m numbers that quickly. It's heads. We got to do Lord of the Rings first. <laughs> all right. Easy, intermediate, or hard? Uh, Hard is going to be all similar, really. And let's do intermediate. All righty. <clears throat> ah. Do not meddle in the affairs of who, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Ah, it's wizards. Yes. You would not believe how many t-shirts have variants on that at any given sci-fi <laughs> convention. My you know, favorite. I actually do believe it. <laughs> my favorite is uh, do not meddle in the affairs of dragons, for you are crunchy and good with ketchup. Um, mm. <laughs> I like that one because it scans well. What do the elves call Gandalf? Oh, fuck. Uh, it's like myth something. Uh, Mithrandir. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> Trivia is a collaborative medium. <laughs> What is Pippin's full name? Oh, uh... Last name is Took. I know that. It's Peregrine it... Took. Yes. Ah, yes. Oh, yes, teamwork. Yeah! <laughs> what is the name of Sam's pony? 
Oh no. Uh doesn't he have one of like the one one of those Tolkien names where it's like literally just a dude, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think it's got like a dude name. Uh I just don't remember what it is. It's something very, very cute. It's a little mm, twee as Frank, I recall. John. <laughs> it's not Frank Finn, or John. Craig. Um Bill Warren. <laughs> Bill Jones. Wait, I think it genuinely might be Bill. Is it Bill? Let's find out. Oh shit, it's Bill! It's Bill! <laughs> I was like, Bill the Pony! Wait, Bill the Pony? <laughs> In my head, I'm connecting <laughs> strings on a cardboard. Uh, where, geographically speaking, was Frodo stabbed? In the so shoulder, what, in as I recall. <laughs> no, I, th- I think they mean in what location on the map oh, was Frodo stabbed. They were, they were at that, like, ruined tower. I've been very slowly rewatching the movies, like, in five-minute increments, and I just got past oh, that part. Oh, it's got, it's, uh, it's got kind of like a... It's got, like, a swank Tolkien name, but it's also just, like, it's a ruined tower where they're attacked by Nazgul. Yeah. Standard stuff. Uh, on Weathertop. Weathertop. Oh, you know what? Yeah, that that makes sense. Who composed the music for the Lord of the Rings films? Oh, come on. Yeah. Howard Shore, baby. Yeah. I wasn't going to guess John Williams, but it's definitely Howard Shore. (laughs) No, Red. (laughs) Famously Howard Shore. I know it's really good, but, like, I'm busy. (laughs) I got other shit going on. John Williams out of here. Yeah. Who is Gimli's father? Glowin. Yes. Gimli, son of Glowin. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I, my favorite thing about Thorin is that he is son of Thrain, son of Thror. It sounds so good. Everything else about him is terrible. <laughs> yes. Although smitten with Aragorn, who does Eowyn marry in the... Uh, Faramir. Yeah, it's Faramir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Faramir. <laughs> Always second best. <laughs> oh, Faramir. Yeah, well. <laughs> who is next in line after Theoden for the throne of Rohan? Uh... Oh fuck! He has a son, but he's he. No, he's he doesn't die. He's fine. And isn't he played by that one guy? Mm. You know the guy. Yeah. He, he plays like Bones in the new Star Trek movies. Oh, oh yeah, yeah that guy. That guy. Um, that guy. He Bones. Plays, yeah. Another grumpy favorite. Yeah. Uh, uh Anyway, <laughs> we remember the character. We just don't remember his name. Uh. Eomir. Eom- I knew it sounded similar to Eowyn, but yeah. Who took the ring from Sauron? Uh, Isildur. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, on account of it being Great. Isildur's bane. Well, that was ten Lord of the Rings questions. We should do so the hard we ones now. <laughs> we should do the hard ones? We should do All the right, hard ones, and then it. we should do the Whedonverse ones. All right, I got no yeah, problem. Yeah. I love trivia. Yeah. This is just practice for my inevitable ascent <laughs> to grace on him, actually. Yes. Um, first question. Aragorn's ring is called what? Arag- oh, no. Uh- <laughs> ring of... And then I don't know what the word is. Uh, Aragorn has a ring? <laughs> well, this is already off to a bad start. We got so cocky with the mm. with the intermediate. I got nothing. We uh, probably were hot shit. Even star, maybe? Uh, the Ring of Barahir. Oh, yeah, we were never going to get that. Adoras is the capital of what kingdom? God damn it, Adoras. Uh, I think it's Rohan, right? Yeah, it's probably Rohan. Let's give it a shot. Ooh, Rohan. Yeah. Whew. Uh, prior to leaving on the quest to destroy the ring, what was Sam's occupation? He was a gardener. Hell yeah. He was dropping no eaves, Sam, sir. the gardener. <laughs> Technically, he's still a gardener uh, after he comes back. Just a little more badass. That's very about true. It. Yeah, he's just got a few more scars, you know. Yeah. Um, what was Sam's occupation after he returned from the quest? Well, he actually did he become mayor or something? I think he did become mayor. All right, but also still a gardener. So I think we're covering our bases. Oh, yep, he was elected mayor. Ha ha. <laughs> what creatures nearly kill the four hobbits under a burial mound? Oh, Barrel Whites. Those guys were scary as fuck. I don't know why they weren't in the movies. Ding, ding. What was a Roderuin? Oh, boy. What? I can't pronounce names. O-R-O-D-R-U-I-N. A Roderuin? Uh, More commonly referred to as. Uh, I'm going to guess that's Saruman's real name or something like that. It's Mount Doom. Damn it. <laughs> No one has ever called it anything but Mount Doom, damn it. <laughs> oh, the scary volcano. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
What was the password to enter the mines of Moria? Oh, uh... Oh, I know this one because... <laughs> yeah, the elvish for friend, Melon. Yeah, it's Melon. melon. Yeah, it's Melon. <laughs> my, um, our home computer when I was a kid, that was our password. Oh, that's my so dad cute. was a huge nerd. Uh, so I couldn't I know tell. This one by heart. <laughs> also, I gotta say, I, I've gone on record saying how much I love uh, apocalypse logs and, like, Day one, everything's great. Day 10, everything's fucked. Uh, drums in the deep, we cannot get out. And it's definitely because my dad read me the Minds of Moria chapter at a very formative age, and it <laughs> terrified me in a way that I really enjoyed. Nerdy dads really do have the most influence on children. Right? <laughs> um, We're all just the X-23s does... to our parents' Wolverines. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. Uh, who does Sam marry upon returning to Hopton? Oh fuck! Uh, it's uh, Rosie, right? R- yeah, it's Rosie. Yeah, yeah. She's the gardener and the flower. And yeah. Oh yeah, it's cute. Yeah, it's Rosie. Who is Arwen's maternal grandmother? What? Oh wait, uh, Galadriel, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Tolkien and hasn't written Lord very of- many female characters. <laughs> no. If you know three names, you've kind of got them all covered. Yeah. Um. Well, the final question of the Lord of the Rings category: Who wields the sword of Onderil? Onderil? Oh, wait, is that Gandalf? Is it Aragorn? No, Ga- I don't think uh, it's Gandalf. Gandalf ha- or uh, Aragorn has. I know his sword is special. I think this one might be Gandalf, but if you think it's Aragorn, well, we're probably right. going to be right either way. And flipping, it's Aragorn. Ah, I was being yeah. too clever. I know he has a sword, but. Anyway, that was fun. All right. That was a good cat. That was a yeah. good round. Whoop. Should we uh, do our Whedon verse Yeah, let's one? do our Whedon one. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> intermediate, or hard? I'm curious what they define hard Whedon verse quotes are. I feel like the problem- Hard it is! <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the problem is going to be that, like, all of Joss Whedon's characters sound the same. So, <laughs> well, um... let's see what this looks like. Oh, right. Gandalf's sword is Glamdring. That's why I, I knew he had a cool sword, mm. but- Anyway, yes, his does sort of just sound like a um, like a disco. Uh, Andrew Will is the flame of the West. You know, if I just knew all of Tolkien's conlangs, I wouldn't be having this <laughs> difficulty. So the first quote from the Whedon verse: uh, "It's been a big day, what with the abduction and all." Um, Fuck, that could be literally anything. <laughs> I think it's from Firefly. I uh, don't remember who says it. It could be. They don't get kidnapped very much, but. Yeah, that's probably Firefly. Uh, it was Simon Tam, Firefly yeah. episode safe. All right, that makes sense. So Dawn's in trouble. Must be Tuesday. Well, that's um, Buffy, I'm right? One hundred percent sure that's Buffy from Buffy. <laughs> uh, maybe. Well, okay. But the question is, would Buffy sound that flippant about her? Is that her sister? Her sister being in trouble? Yeah. Maybe 100% it's like Xander or something. <laughs> well, okay. Why not? Let's see. This is uh, yep. Buffy Summer is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Great. S- how really. silly of me I think to I just assume that... that episode. <laughs> how silly of me to think that perhaps she would express a modicum of concern. <laughs> no, no, no. As we know, women who fight uh, evil things must be quippy at all times. Yes. Um. Well, personally, I kind of want to slay the dragon. Let's go to work. Um. Hmm. Well, I don't know. You're the resident Buffy expert. Does that sound like a Buffy I thing? I don't. It sounds like Buffy, but I think it's from Angel. I think it's a. Oh, I think it's a Mister. Oh, Angel. I think, it's, I think it's from Angel. Forgot about Angel. All right, let's give it a mm. shot. Yeah, Angel from Angel. Damn. Not away. Nice work. Whew, whew, I hate how much of this I know. <laughs> I just watched a bunch of Buffy recently. It's top of mind. Oh boy. Um. Sure, it's humiliating having to lie there while the better man refuses to spill your blood. Mercy is oh. the mark of a great man. Guess I'm just a good man. Yeah. Well, I'm all right. It's Firefly. It's Captain Mal. It's from Firefly. Firefly. It's Captain Mal. The minute I was reading it, I was like, I should have done this with like a vague Western accent. Yeah, and I guess I'm like, just a good man. <laughs> oh, I'm all right. <laughs> yep, so Malcolm Reynolds, t-shirts. Firefly, yep. Shindig. Yep. My entire existence was constructed by a sociopath and a sweater vest. What do you suggest I do? That could be. Well, it's not a very long list. But I feel like it's probably, it feels like one of those, like, evil sort of slayers from Buffy. I don't think it's from Buffy. I think it's from Dollhouse, but I haven't seen oh, Dollhouse. That's So I don't possible. know for sure or any of the character names. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. 
Uh, yeah, Saunders and Dollhouse, episode Val. Well, I mean, nice work nailing down the show, at least. Yeah, it just sounded a little bit... There were two... No one in Buffy was wearing a sweater vest. The <laughs> Doesn't Passion Giles wear a 90s. sweater vest? That's true. Yeah. That's true. Giles does That's wear a sweater vest That's what I was thinking, like, occasionally. yeah. Anyway. Hmm. You know what? You might have been <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew her, and then she's, there's just a body, and I don't understand why she just can't get back in it and not be dead anymore. I know this one. This is from one of the only episodes of Buffy that I've heard is just uncritically (laughs) good. Uh, It's that one demon lady from the episode after Buffy's mom dies. Oh, oh, um, Anya. Yeah. 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 Flipping it? Yep. Yep. Anya, Buffy, the vampire slayer, the body. You can tell it's a good line because it doesn't sound interchangeably quippy or like it belongs in the Avengers. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Are you asking me to dance? It's gotta be from Firefly, right? I think that's right. But it also that could sounds... be from anything. Mm. I'm gonna guess Firefly. Yeah. From like the party episode. It might be Inara. It might be one of those random side characters that they introduce to make the Inara Mal romance seem a little bit less foregone as a conclusion. <laughs> uh it was Kaylee. Kaylee, that was the other possibility. Yeah, because there's that whole deal where she's like, I'm not like other girls. I wear overalls. I wear coveralls. Uh, but I'd sure love um, to have a really pink frilly dress to go to a nice ball in. <laughs> it's like, you tell mm-hmm. them, Kaylee. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Buffy, what are we going to do now? <laughs> Gee, I wonder what show it could be. <laughs> well, I think we got the show narrowed down, but like, who who would be snarky like that? Maybe like Spike or something? <laughs> I hope it's Spike. I like Spike so much. I think he's the one good character. <laughs> As I understand, he and got he done dirty up. later. So Spike shows up when Angel's still on the show. Right. And Angel's still like the primary love interest. And Spike rolls in and he does one trench coat flip and he steps out of the car. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this man has more charisma in one trench coat flip <laughs> than Angel has had in two seasons of trying to make him charismatic and mysterious. I didn't want to be I... mean, but like I've seen the first couple episodes of Buffy when Angel shows up and he's introduced as like, I'm hunky, but kind of dangerous. And I was like, that's just a guy. You can get six he's packs of him at 7-Eleven. <laughs> Spike shows up and it's like, oh, some flavor for once? <laughs> I don't care if his hair looks like wig. It's the frosted tips to the extreme and the high cheekbones are what make the cheekbones his character really interesting. make that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think we're guessing this might be Spike. Uh, oh, it was Don. Don. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Well, we know okay, it was from Buffy so at least. <laughs> okay, so he survived an unspeakable hell dimension. I mean, who hasn't? But you can't just leave him all alone on the streets of Los Angeles. That's got to be Angel, right? Yeah. That but, like, who right. said that? Like, what supporting character in Angel is playing the role of moral compass? You know, who is snarky enough to do that? <laughs> or, like, who's sincere enough to suggest that showing compassion for a person is a good also idea? true. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We're going to guess Angel. Okay. Fred from Angel. Who the fuck is Fred? <laughs> Oh, I think he's one of the, like, ride-along sidekicks. Oh, that really narrows it down. I, I haven't really watched Angel in a while, because I kind of just don't care. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, This is going to be one of those talks where I do all the talking, isn't it? Uh, this, I think, is also from Angel. It could also be Firefly. It could be, but it doesn't sound familiar, and I haven't seen I Angel. I think it's Angel or Buffy, because I think it's Cordelia, the, oh. like, vampire chick who Spike rolls in with originally. I thought and her my deal was that she was Angel, crazy. That, like, yeah, she chills out a bit more in Angel, though, so that's why I'm thinking maybe it's that. Hmm. She's just she's got a lot of uh, moments of like making the broody guy talk to her. Okay, that's well, it might be that. Is. Let's find out. Cordelia, Angel, oh, heartthrob. Nice work. I hate that I was as good at that as it was. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that greatly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's 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 quotable Whedon verse. Them Should we try the mediums? Fun. I can't believe there was no Avengers in there. Uh, there's a separate trivia for Avengers. Do you want to just do Avengers trivia? Nah. <laughs> I kind of like the Weed and Duncan. <laughs> and if we All do right, Avengers, there might be other writers. <laughs> Yay! Well, my days of not taking you seriously are certainly coming to a middle. Oh, that's straight Firefly. That's Captain that's Mal. That's Firefly. Yeah. 100%. I think he was talking yep, to Jane yep. about his stupid hat. 
Yeah. Oh, I love that hat. I love that hat too. (laughs) I want that hat so bad. I feel like maybe (laughs) the show wanted me to like Jane more than I did because he was a real piece of shit. But anyway. Yeah, he really told that he was one of the few angry trigger happy guy that was like usually i love this character type and for some reason this one is not working quite as well as he normally does well the problem is they need um, a secret heart of gold for you to like him otherwise they're just a yeah dick. And jane doesn't really have one no they never really gave him a chance to prove like that when the chips were down he would choose his crew over himself and so they just show him choosing himself over his crew a lot so anyway mm-hmm. i don't handle rejection well funny considering all the practice i've had huh that's a 100% a Xander line, right? There. That, yeah, that, that, that well, screams. that could be any of Joss Whedon's self pitying self inserts, <laughs> but it's probably Xander. Mm. It seems very unsubtle. Yeah, that's Xander from Buffy the Vampires. <laughs> wow. That's sad how quickly. I don't mean sad Ooh. for you, I mean sad for the writing quality. It's, it's sad for both of us. Yeah, it's fair. <laughs> it can be poor Kato Los Uh I remember everything. Sometimes I'm someone else and then I come back, but I still feel them, all of them. I've been many people. I can hear them sometimes suddenly. I'm all of them, but none of them is me. Do you know who's real? That was a lot of words. That's and definitely I Dollhouse. I think that's the entire premise of Dollhouse. Is that the premise of Dollhouse? Well, like, my initial guess was going to be River Tam, but she never says that many words in that quick succession. Um, mm. So I think it's the other uh, psychic, emotionally damaged uh, waif who needs somebody to take care <laughs> of her, even though she's a real ass kicker. So. I don't know mm-hmm. which character in Dollhouse it is because I don't know anything about that show. Because believe it or not, I didn't watch it because it seemed really creepy. But well, you are right; it is Dollhouse. It's the character Echo. Heck yeah! Oh, I got some Avengers for you. Oh, you yeah. and I remember Budapest very differently. Wow, really? It's fucking Hawkeye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was Black Widow to Hawkeye. Uh, well, fine. <laughs> You know what? That's what the flip the card flip says. We're I'm actually still right. right. I'm actually <laughs> Oh, I'm not having this. <laughs> not in the Joss Whedon flashcard section. Uh next one. Too much hair. What the fuck? I think this might be River from Firefly. Oh. Because they do that whole like get out of the box, get, you know, situated. It could be. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's entirely possible, actually. It is River Tam from Firefly. Yeah. No context, I assume? Nope. Of course not. It says the name in the show. Uh, Of course. I've done the whole mind control thing. Not a fan. Oh, yes. That's Hawkeye in Age of Ultron to Wanda. They really like Hawkeye and Natasha. Yeah, yeah, they really do. I don't want to use the word genius, but I'd be okay if you wanted to. Oh, no. Um... Uh, that Not Iron Man quote is it? Uh, well, here's the problem. Tony does like using the word genius. Mm. It could be Bruce Banner, but I'm more inclined to suggest it's probably one of the more like egotistical guys, or or possibly it could be someone from Buffy. Anyone from Buffy um, mm. could be Bruce Banner specifically. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Topher from Dollhouse. That, okay. We're way off. We were never going to get that. Nope. They want me in a submerged, pressurized metal container. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the Hulk. That that's is Bruce indeed Bruce. the Bruce Banner. <laughs> and I believe it's yep. immediately followed by the helicarrier taking off and him saying, oh, this is much worse, which was a genuinely yes. funny line. <laughs> genuinely funny line. I like Mark that Ruffalo, he treated himself like a time Wolverine. bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we tried to stop her by hitting her fists and feet with our faces, but she got away. That feels fully Buffy. Yeah, that feels... That's, that's Wait, in the Buffy-Angel dichotomy. That could also be in that one episode of Firefly where a companion shows up and, like, knocks a few people out. But I think probably Buffy. Buffy has more fighting. It was Charles Gunn from Angel. Oh, so well, it's kind enough. of in the same space. And final question of the evening. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. Oh. This, I know exactly what it's from. But it's not because it's a Joss Whedon thing. I, okay. My guess is an episode of Firefly. Do you have a, do you have a? This is Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing because Joss Whedon did a Much Ado About Nothing movie that was all black and white and he shot it at someone's house. What? Yeah, Colson's in it whole thing what 
god. Yeah. I mean, I thought it sounded really weird, so I assumed it was one of those like Southern Belle types from the one Firefly episode where they just spend the whole time at a brothel. But nope, that's straight Shakespeare. Baby. Straight Shakespeare. I think putting that like. in a fucking Joss Whedon quote book is disingenuous at best. <laughs> <laughs> wow. oh, yeah, I... Oof. That's a lot. That was a lot that just happened. <laughs> a lot that's, that's a lot to take in. Well, I think that was pretty fun, not just because we're creeping up on hour four of the stream and it's well past midnight. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think we covered a lot of interesting it ground. Yeah, we started at trivia and then we left it and then we came back, cycled around. Yeah, real right. hero's journey on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a real adventure. Um, my cat is currently asleep in the hallway. She's just <laughs> doing the thing that she does where she stretches out entirely. Good. Which is usually my cue to turn off all the lights and try and coax her into a room just somewhere more comfortable, like her cat bed. Incredible. But... Okay. Uh,. Yeah, I think we should probably wind this down and go to bed, but um <laughs> probably. Yeah. Statistically. <laughs> um but yeah, I, I hope everybody enjoyed. Uh obviously stay tuned for Friday when we will have both an episode of OSP stuff going up and an episode of Rolling with Difficulty. So Ooh. good good week to catch up on that if you're interested, and you should be, because it's a lot of fun. Um I think that's kind of all our ground covered. Uh yeah, I got nothing, so yeah. alrighty. <laughs> then I will uh find a way to end this stream. And we will all That's talk to you guys neat. later. Bye. Adios.